We're back with news again at 10 o'clock. Check all of today's news on our website, highlandradio.com. But for now, from the news team, good morning. Sorry, you wouldn't have a table, please. Oh, sorry. Do you want to sit down? Irish people can be very polite, but sometimes it pays to be direct. Come direct to Energia for our best rates on electricity and gas with Ireland's cheapest dual fuel bundle, as well as real-time energy insights to help you manage your usage. It means you're getting a better deal. And we're not sorry. Switch today at energia.ie. Energia Smart Data Plan, EAB 2,490 euro. Standing charge, PSO levy, carbon tax and discounted unit rates apply. Full details including associated terms and conditions at energia.ie. And now, it's time for the talk of the Northwest, The 9 to Noon Show, with Greg Hughes on Highland Radio. Hello, good morning to you. Four and a half minutes past nine on this Wednesday, the 10th of April, 2024. You're very welcome along to another edition of The 9 to Noon Show, and we have our usual mix for you. But we also have uh, our lines open for you to talk about what you want to talk about. Uh, maybe there's an issue you wish to raise, uh, something positive that you wish to highlight. We're open for all 07491 25000 Donna Marie and Shannon taking your calls today 07491 25000 if you want to whatsapp or text 0866 25000 0866 25000 and a reminder for you that if you want to send your voice notes to us uh, and we can play them out in air for you it's another way to get your point of view across get them into us right now 086 60 25000 that's the whatsapp number as well as i mentioned but that's for your voice notes if you want to send uh, your comments in that way an email is always there for you hopefully you're on email 08 uh, that's the number uh comments at highlandradio.com that's it comments at highlandradio.com and we're streaming live for you to watch the show if it suits you and your lifestyle we're on the x platform at highland radio on youtube highland radio ireland so you can watch us on your smart tv or your fire stick and facebook highland hub highland radio news and uh, sport the Finn valley voice this morning Dr. Dennis McCauley, the newly appointed president of the Irish Medical Organisation, voiced grave concerns about the ongoing challenges plaguing the country's healthcare system. Uh, addressing the IMO annual general meeting in Killarney on Saturday, uh, Dr. McCauley underscored the detrimental impact of bed consultant GP shortages, which have resulted in alarming long waiting lists. And uh, Dr. McCall is going to join us on the show a little later on as well uh, live. Uh, we'll tease out many of those issues with him as well. Uh, so were you glued to your TV yesterday for all the, the pomp and ceremony of... Uh, Simon Harris becoming uh, T-Shock. I thought some of the commentary was quite amusing. Like, I actually did chuckle. It was almost like the BBC do a royal wedding, you know, and it's uh, Peter Burke is standing on the steps and I see Patrick O'Donovan there taking a selfie and they wait as Simon Harris is set to emerge and, uh, oh, Jennifer uh, Carol McNeil is there, you know what I mean? And I just thought, oh, hold on, you lads. We, we see these people all of the time, It's you know. But anyway, uh, T-Shock Simon Harris has played it safe, we're told, with a Conservative cabinet reshuffle despite the promise of new energy. The new Fine Gael leader put geography ahead of gender as he uh, handed promotions to men from the Midlands and Munster. Government sources insist there is strong logic behind keeping the rest of Leo Varadkar's team in place, including concerns that the civil service... This is a really important line. The reason uh, some are saying he kept Leo Varadkar's team in place is because the civil service would run rings around new ministers if there was a wholesale change. Who is running the country, folks? I think uh, we often uh, talk on this show uh, that really often it is more likely the civil service than the actual uh, elected representatives. But the Irish Independent can also reveal details of the intense lobbying behind the scenes that influenced Mr Harris's choices over recent days. Former Tonister Francis Fitzgerald is said to have been instrumental in saving Justice Minister Helen McEntee from 
motion. And Social Protection Minister Heather Humphreys uh, pushed for Limerick TD Patrick O'Donovan to take over as Minister for Further and Higher Education. The two women are close uh, confidants of the new tea shop. So there you have it. Uh, we shall see. Uh, a 240,000 euro salary, uh, which is nice, isn't it? And a jet, there are perks to the office. New Taoiseach Simon Harris says his appointment as leader of the country is the honour of his life. However, there are more concrete benefits to the office. The total pay, €239,000 a year. Mr Harris's earnings are made up of 111000 and an additional 127000 for holding the office of Taoiseach. Either salary is about three times the average Irish worker's salary of €44,000. Now, that €44,000 is often talked of as the average Irish worker's salary, I can tell you the average salary in Donegal is much lower than €44,000. But anyway, the Taoiseach gets six times the average standard wage, even if far below some chief executive salaries available in the private sector. There is also the modern anomaly that the Taoiseach earns substantially less than some senior civil servants, such as a Health Secretary General, Robert Watt, who is uh, entitled to over €75,000 more. Can you imagine, like, if you can... It's why are senior civil servants, why are politicians paid so much? Uh, and then you see the difficulty is, is, oh, maybe they can, I don't know. But if you don't sort of live the life of an average person or understand the impact of the increase in the cost of price of milk or 15 cent on your soft drink or whatever it might be, petrol, diesel, it's very difficult, I think, to is it not, understand what it's like in the real world when you are clearly not living or don't have to live in the real world. But it's not just like that here. That's just the way the world's run, it seems. The Irish Times, the government will formally recognise the state of Palestine in a long-awaited move expected to take place in the coming weeks. Hours after Simon Harris was elected Taoiseach, Thomas Drew, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Michal Martin, told the doll the approach of delaying recognition is not credible or tenable any longer. He said he'd been in discussions about uh, recognition with other countries involved in peace activities in Gaza, Gaza, adding, it is my intention to bring to government a formal proposal to recognise uh, when these wider international discussions are complete, but he is no in no doubt recognition of a Palestinian state will happen, uh, Mr Martin said. Now, just as uh, to, to read this, oh, this paper's all mangled on me. Uh, you might, if you were listening on Friday, we had a chat with Seamus Gone about um, payments, yeah, for for accidents, compensation claims, and what have you. And we were awaiting the outcome of a court judgment uh, on insurance premiums and the book of quantum and all this type of stuff. So this is uh, something of a follow up to that conversation with Seamus on Friday, and it's covered widely in the newspapers. Insurance premiums must be cut following a landmark Supreme Court judgment approving lower levels of compensation for injuries. That's according to ministers and campaigners after the seven judge court ruled that personal injury award guidelines voted into force by judges three years ago are legally binding. The court dismissed most of the claims brought by Bridget Delaney from Dungarvan, who tripped on a pavement in 2019 and sued Waterford City and County Council. She believed her fractured ankle was worth up to 11 times more than the €3,000 she was offered by the personal uh, injuries assessment board. Her action against the PIAB the Judicial Council in the state was the lead case among several challenges to the lower rates of compensation for minor accidents, which have been um, awards for pain and suffering reduced by up to 40%. Judge Peter uh, Charlatan said the court had been made aware that the result of this case as to the validity and operation of the personal injury guidelines passed by the Judicial Council will influence thousands of cases currently awaiting judicial analysis and multiples of that into the future. So this was a lead case effectively, which said, my, she said, my injuries uh, are worth more than €3,000. Uh, the €3,000 was um, awarded by the Personal Injuries Assessment Board. And what this might do now, they expect it to do, it seems, is to discourage other cases along the same lines and now there are calls for these obvious savings to insurance companies to be passed on to us, the consumer. They have to pay out less, so they should be charging us less. 
Just a little bit of an insight into the horse racing industry and our treatment of horses in this country. Um, it kind of somewhat came as news to me. It's in the Irish Daily Star. Nearly 50 thoroughbred race horses under two years old were among 1,428 horses slaughtered for meat in Ireland last year, new figures have revealed. The age profile of the horses killed in the meat factories last year has been described as deeply disturbing by the animal aid charity. Their own investigation into the slaughter of race horses led to major changes in the industry in 2021. They uh, formed the basis of a panorama documentary which claimed that injured Irish racehorses were being transported to the UK abattoirs contrary to animal welfare guidelines. New details have emerged ahead of the UK Grand National at Aintree this weekend where 33 of the 50 runners will come from Ireland. It also follows the launch of a new communications campaign regarding animal welfare by the British Horse Racing Authority uh, last week. Uh, so 49 thoroughbreds aged under two among 1,428 horses killed for meat. Now, I am not sure if they're UK or Irish figures. It does say it is in Ireland, um, but I'll have to double-check that because the, the, the number does seem very, very high, but it's in the Irish Daily Star. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, I don't think that's what people think the tens of millions of euro going into the horse racing industry uh, would be supporting. <laughs> The Irish Sun this morning, a dad has warned parents to be vigilant after he discovered a Facebook international dating site for kids. This is really, really quite worrying. I did see this screenshotted and shared on social media. kind of thought, could this possibly be real? Because it's so open for exploitation by um, bad adults. Uh, James Toomey shared the sick page for 9- to 18-year-olds on a local community group in Cork. Outraged parents successfully launched a campaign to have uh, the site taken down. James said some 99% of the page's comments were people saying that it needed to be taken down. People were just disgusted, uh, which is kind of worrying, isn't it? Uh, and if that's one that's spotted, how many are not spotted? And you can just see it being used as a tool for uh, exploitation, very sadly. And finally, and I think this is something we're going to have to get a little bit used to uh, going forward, such as the way the world uh, is at the moment. It's in the Irish Daily Mirror. Security has been ramped up for this week's Champion League matches after Islamic State terrorists issued a chilling threat. An image of a masked gunman and the words kill them all alongside the names of four football stadiums were published by a pro-IS media channel. The venues, including Arsenal's Emirates Stadium, where the North London club hosted Bayern Munich last night in their quarter-final first leg. Another one listed was Real Madrid's Barnabu Stadium, where Manchester City played yesterday. So IS are formally threatening these types of events. And as I say, with everything that's going on in the world and um, you know some of the actions that's been taken uh, are probably going to lead to more and more of that uh, going forward. Very, very sadly. All right, that was a run through uh, the papers. We'll be joined by our first guest on this morning's 9 till noon show very, very shortly. Daily newspapers are courtesy of Kelly Centra and Diner Mountaintop Letter Kenny, winner of Best Family Dining at the Highland Radio Hospitality Awards. The 9 till noon show with Letterkenny Credit Union. Simplify your debts with a debt consolidation loan from Letterkenny Credit Union. Call us on 074-910-2126 or apply online via our app or in office today. Mike Denver in concert with guests Philomena Begley and Brendan Shine at the Millennium Forum Derry this Saturday, April 13th. Tickets on sale now at the Millennium Forum box office. That's Mike Denver with guests Philomena Begley and Brendan Shine at the Millennium Forum Derry this Saturday, April 13th. Don't miss a great concert. Measles is highly infectious and can be serious. About one out of five people who get measles will be hospitalised. The best protection against the measles is vaccination. If you or your child miss the MMR vaccine, the HSE is now offering a free catch-up program for children and eligible adults. And once fully vaccinated, you're protected for life. To find out how to get your vaccine and to book an appointment, visit hse.ie forward slash measles from the HSE. 
Experience total relaxation in the spa at Orchids at the Holyrood Hotel Bondoran, recently awarded Best Hotel Spa Getaway at the RSVP Spa Awards. Enjoy luxury spa baths, revitalizing facials, rejuvenating massages, pampering body treatments, outdoor hot tub and tranquil Japanese garden. Visit on a luxury spa day, pop in for some me time or buy the perfect present with a gift voucher. Relax and let the spa at Orchids transport you to another world. See HolyroodHotel.com the CFC Interior Stock Disposal Sale is now on. Due to renovations, an incredible £1.5 million worth of stock must go. Don't miss our highest ever discount on selected ranges across all departments. The Stock Disposal Sale at CFC Interiors Derry, Cookstown and Abbey Centre. Sale now on. Celebrate exceptional businesses in Donegal. Nominate your favourite for the Highland Radio Customer Service Awards in association with Michael Henney's Department Store. Our Customer Service Awards celebrate the businesses that go above and beyond to provide excellent customer service. To nominate your favourite business, simply visit highlandradio.com, fill out the nomination form and tell us why you love this business. The winners will receive recognition at our special award ceremony on June the 9th. Plus, they'll have the satisfaction of knowing that they made a positive impact on their customers. Nominate now. Nominations close 23rd of April. Now, we have uh, spoken regularly about uh, access uh, to uh, Green on of Alia over uh, the last number of years. Uh, but unfortunately, now we're talking about those who have gained access and uh, are involved in uh, unsavoury behaviour. Bettina joins us on the programme again. Bettina, good morning to you. Good morning, Craig. How are you? I'm doing okay. Right. So, uh, what what's happening, uh, or what has been happening uh, up at Greenon of Alia? Well, the last few weeks, basically since the um, equinox um, in March, uh, I have been observed that uh, someone drove a motorbike inside the Greenon uh, and just uh, had a few loops and left again. You could see the tire tracks inside, and. Uh, that was now a couple of occasions, and uh, last Sunday, someone drove uh, a squat bike around the Greenen. Uh, it was actually observed by a friend of mine who was visiting his mother, and he could see the lights coming in and out, which would go with someone riding uh, around the, the Greenen. And this is very worrying, because we only uh, got... Uh, a more open access back to the green and um, from the OPW and behavior and actions like this can only lead to one outcome and this is the OPW locking the green and up again and this is very worrying and very uh, much uh, concerning that this could happen again because of a few people uh, abusing uh, the, the, the open gate for such actions what can be done, though? I mean, uh, you can uh, make the appeal that could fall on deaf ears. As you say, uh, the OPW could very easily say, you know, we can't police this all of the time. There uh, could be risk to the individuals or those attending there. There could be a big claim, and therefore we're going to have to restrict access once again to the fort, which is one of the things uh, that you have a, a concern about. But what can be done to discourage this type of behaviour? Well, I basically would I would ask those people involved in it uh, to stop, and anyone observing it, taking photos, the license plate, if possible, and report them to the guards. Because, as I said, if it if it can't be stopped, if it won't stop, then then there is only one uh, action um, available to the OPW to lock it up again, and that would be for the protection of the monument. You know, so, and uh, I mean, I was there on, on Monday evening for the eclipse mm -hmm. and you wouldn't believe the amount of people who were there. The car park was overflowing. Yeah. People actually had to park along the road, you know, and there were families and there were groups of young people and there were couples, you know. Um, I completely, as I'd done the petition, I completely had, had forgotten about the eclipses because they only happen so rarely. But it's like a tradition that people go up, you know. And um, this, of course, was in the evening at 8 o'clock. Uh, if, if the OPW locks the monument again, that would have not been possible. People could not have come, mm -hmm. you know. So 
uh, basically people here, local people, have to help to stop this type of behavior. That if they know of someone who's doing it, or if they observe someone doing it, that they put a stop to it. Okay. Before the OPW put push yep. the lock on the gate back again. <clears throat> Indeed. And it's, uh, I tell you, if this act, uh, type of activity continues... It is a likelihood which would be uh, awful for this, uh, especially with the extended uh, access and opening hours if this were to happen. OK, but now thank you very much for your time this morning. I do appreciate it as always. Uh, John McAteer uh, of the Chicago Tribune joins me on the show now. John McAteer, good morning to you. How are you keeping this fine Wednesday morning? I'm fine, despite the fact it's not a great Wednesday morning. It's just lashing rain. Yeah, lashing. It is. It's misly, and I think it's going to be like that for most of the day. But hopefully, as I said earlier, hopefully next week we might get some sort of a rest bite. Um, I'm not sure you're the biggest fan of, of this current government um, or not, uh, John, but I think you're not. But were you underwhelmed by by Simon Harris's, uh, I suppose, elevation to Taoiseach and subsequent sort of slight reshuffle? Underwhelmed, I suppose, in a certain way. The reshuffle, I, su- I suppose, has uh, much as expected. P- Peter Burke uh, in the Midlands and Patrick O'Donovan in the Limerick. It was quite evident that he had very little choice there because Fine Gael was going to have no se- senior ministerial post in, in the whole province of Munster. Munster. Yet Fianna Fáil had Michael Martin and Michael McGrath and Norma Foley. So that was inevitable. There was going to be Patrick O'Donovan because he's from... He's from Limerick County, he, Newcastle West. He's there eight years as a junior minister, pretty competent. Uh, I suppose Peter Burke, not as well known, but very. But, but he, he is an accountant, so he, he's he's uh, he's pretty well fit for enterprise and employment. Uh, underwhelmed, definitely. Uh, it was quite ov- obvious that whilst uh, Simon Harris is in control, he's not the boss. And Fine Fine Gael headquarters is going to dictate that at all times. Uh, how 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 much better is the cabinet? Probably, it's like a like a new paint. You you would hardly notice it was put there. A lot of attention was on uh, the future of Justice Minister Helen McEntee. A, a, a lot of people wanted her moved out. Uh, of uh, justice and and maybe you know it could have been seen as a new broom and maybe they could have adjusted some policy or messaging in relation to um, some of the responsibilities under her portfolio but also to the fear was is that it could be seen as a victory for those who are anti Helen McEntee often some of them labelled as the far right and inverted commas Uh, so really Mm, in the end he played it safe and just sat with her there he probably had no choice because Helen McEntee is royalty within the party. The McEntee name is one is one of the legendary names of Fine Gael. And I would say that whether he wanted to do it or whether he didn't, he had no choice. He was, he was going to be hemmed in there by the hierarchy within Fine Gael, and that's how politics works. And Helen McEntee, while it's just been a, been a very poor four years for her, uh, it's been a very difficult time for her as well, given that the relationship between the Garda Commissioner and the Garda is at an all-time low and the numbers in the force haven't been able to be brought up to where they should be. Uh, uh, did she deserve to be moved? I would have said so. Uh, so we, we're we still going, going to continue for the next 11 months because we're down to about 11 months now before an election. We're still going to be left with Helen McEntee there, whether we like her, whether we don't, or whether he likes it or whether he doesn't. So it was a, it was a bit of an anti-climax last evening at half five when, when he came back to announce... The, those details and got their seats of office. Uh, will it make any real difference? No, it won't, despite you're going to have a promise a day, at least one promise a day from Simon Harris, because that's his modus operandi. He's good at that, and he yeah, forgets the public, about it the yeah, next but, day. Yeah, but, but, but the public are not just going to be passed off with words, are they? To talk of uh, 250 houses, houses being built over the, last, uh, over the next five years... Like, I w- was chatting to people since that announcement was made, and they were saying, well, where are the builders even to build the mica houses? And I know it's not mica, but that's, you know, sort of the common phrase that's used now. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, there is a... I don't... I think if you lined up a 1,000 people, I don't think a 100 of them or even less would think that that's an achievable target. So throwing numbers and figures and promises out doesn't wash it with the Irish electorate, I don't think. 
Oh, absolutely not. Because if, if you looked at the Ireland thinks Poland the independent on Sunday, he has done nothing to lift their 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 ratings in the polls whatsoever. Like he's there for two weeks, so that was the first test of character for him. And with the Irish independent being pretty been pretty uh, forensic in, in, in what to do with their own polls. I would have expected Fine Gael to have risen by about three points. They didn't do that. They went down one. Fine Gael went down one. Sinn Féin went down one. But it is the independents who are making all, all the ground there. Now, Simon Harris will not be fit to get away with what, what, he's, what he's promising to do because there seems to be no thought or no, no... There's no policy, there's no funding, there's no nothing behind that. Uh, at the end of the day, after 13 years in government, Fine Gael in the first four or five years did a very, very good job in restoring the country to some degree of normality from on the international money markets. And like that's fair play to end of Kenny, but since that has been quite downhill because they lost too many seats. Uh, like they're a party in decline, the grassroots is, is in decline. They can't get enough candidates to to, to contest local election seats here in Donegal and I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. Like they are in difficulties. How they can rebuild that? Can they rebuild it? Simon Harris, I don't think so. Well, let's take the government as a whole. Uh, would you agree the top three issues are health, housing, and immigration? Oh, definitely. What oh, order de do you? Definitely. What order would you put them in in terms of um, in terms of the general public in in Ireland? How would you order them? Not in terms of what the most important is, but the things that they're most motivated to vote about. Health, housing, and and, and immigration. You'd put immigration the, last. The top three. I think so. Uh, I think uh, I know. I know what you're saying there. It depends where you have Ukrainians living close to you. Now, we have them in Milford. We have them in Fanet. We don't have any issues whatsoever with them. We meet them regularly. We don't have maybe. Tolerance is probably the word that's, that's missing here, but there's a vacuum there to fill, and there will be candidates. Can I tell you though why I think that's why I think immigration is the top one, because I think people out there think that if we don't get a handle on immigration, housing and health is going to continue to get worse. So I, I don't think until such time as any government. Uh, um, puts out a policy or a strategy that has uh, what appears to be better managed immigration that, that there can be any improvement in housing and health and that's why I actually would put immigration above the two of those because I think that's the one that is far easier to get our heads around it's the one that seems to be the most immediate problem and it's the one that seems to be having the most uh, impact and not for racial reasons or, or anything like or cultural reasons literally just in terms of I think a lot of people out there the majority of people out there think that we need to be doing something to limit the influx of um, immigrants, asylum seekers into this country and until such time as we do so, access to healthcare, be it GP, acute hospital care, whatever it might be, and access to housing is going to continue to be more difficult. But you asked the question, if the Ukrainians weren't here at all, would it do very much in, by, by, by way of uh, improving the healthcare system? Mm. Would it do much in, in, in accommodating families and houses? Because I don't think it actually would. No, all of these problems like, existed, of yeah. course, beforehand, but you can't, yeah. if you have a, and, 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 and to be honest with you, I think also there's a slight difference in people's attitudes towards Ukrainians and also international protection applicants, if the truth be told, right? But yeah. if we had a struggling health system in this country, struggling school system, access to school transport, access to the hospital, access to housing and you increase in a population by 12,000 euro at uh, 12,000 people I beg your pardon obviously people are going to feel whether it's the truth or not that that's having a detrimental impact in the improvement of those services well that's going to be the public perception the public perception is is out there that about 60 percent of people I think the latest polling figures would show that about 63 percent of uh, those polled would suggest that we've already taken in too many uh, immigrants. There's only a very small number in favour of it. There's there's a fair chunk there that's undecided. Yes, like it is a big issue, but I wouldn't take it in isolation. We do have an element out there, and I wouldn't even call them far right. There's a group of people there who are very vocal in the fact that we've taken in too many. I mean, if we didn't take them in, somebody else would have to take them in. 
I mean, we're, we're, like we're bound under 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 conventions of inter, international. Yes, but you see, uh, agreement. I think too, John, and, 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 and I hope you know. I, I don't want to be. I'm certainly not being argumentative. But again, I don't really think that's what the issue is. Is I think the people concern is is that an awful lot of people get off planes for which they had to have a passport to get onto and get off the plane and they have no documentation whatsoever. Very difficult to track or trace who they are. Uh, the system in terms of processing them is very, very uh, slow. You know, I don't think I don't think the, the, the general population's concern, and I could be far, far out, is necessarily about core numbers. It's about how it's being managed and, and who is being let in. Yeah. This has been ongoing now since two years last month, and uh, I think that we have six, seven thousand, maybe, maybe more in Donegal. I think that we have managed that reasonably well, okay. given the circumstances and given the urgency that these people were fleeing war and 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 potential life life threatening e events in the Ukraine. So we had to take them in. We like. We're bound by that by that convention to do so now the question is did we take in too many too quickly uh i might go with uh, accepting that, that that would be the case but you know the country is still not full there are empty houses everywhere yeah Look. but i think when we talk about full it's it's about services rather than properties i mean we've got like 12,000 homes lying empty in donegal so obviously it's not full and we, we had double the population pre-famine i think really when people talk about fullness it's about school places hospital places oh, GPs yeah. appointments oh, yeah. dental appointments but i mean there's a there's a feeling out there that these people have come over here and stolen our jobs and all this kind of thing that is not factual it's, it's, it's not true they, they're getting their entitlements. Those entitlements have been reduced. Perhaps the very first day that we were, we were probably very over generous and given them the full the full amount uh, of of social welfare yeah. and, and given them shelter as well. But that's done and dusted. Like well, that's, it's, going, it's, to be, they're, that's they're, going to be reduced. Yeah, that for, for new reduced. for new arrivals, not for yeah, those currently yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. They're, they're going to be maintained for those currently it, here. It, like it is a very big issue out in the public. There, we're getting that an awful awful lot from from just. The general public out out uh, and about there is an issue about ukrainians uh, it's unfair to name ukrainians but like the the numbers that are there are are mm. are always name checked see but the funny thing is as you see john I, I, again just on this and we'll, we'll move on i have heard very li very little negative conversation about those that are fleeing uh the war in ukraine it is seemingly more uh, international protection applicants that that people seem to be particularly vexed about. But anyway, well, we have about twelve thousand of those, from what I see from the figures, mm -hmm. and that's not a huge number. Maybe it is when you combine the whole lot together. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, I don't, I like, I don't think that that, that the country is still full because, like, I am aware of accommodation which has has been given the status of a uh, uh, of housing refugees but they have not been able to provide evidence that there are school places or health centre places for them. Okay. Uh, we we have that all over the place. And, like, I do I do accept that health centres are full. Health centres have been very full ever since the beginning of COVID. And I wouldn't specifically... Not every Ukrainian is standing at a health centre every day of the week, you know, yeah, or okay, every week of the year. Well, what, did you, what do you think Simon Harris needs to do over the next... Uh, well, I mean, if you by the time... We're going to have a lot of focus on elections, right? And then there's the summer break. So really in terms of, of what can be done between now and the next election, there's not a ton of time. There's a lot of time to talk, but not a lot of time to do anything. What do you think he will try and do... Uh, to to try and win over uh, voters, and do you think he'll be successful in doing so? Well, he's, he's got to get out into places like like Donegal and try and rekindle the organisation, try and get the grassroots motivated, because uh, that hasn't been happening in ten years, and this this is why uh, locally, and this is our constituency, they're at a very very low ebb. Uh, and that very little has been done to motivate the grassroots. Now, that's going to be a very, very big task because, you know, it's not that long to the summer break. I think he has 100 days, I think somebody said yesterday, until the, till the actual summer break. And then they go back in September and they're into preparing for the budget. That debate will take them right up to Christmas time. And I don't think there'll either be an election before Christmas time or one. I don't think they'll come back after Christmas. I think there'll be an election called for February. 
he'll have very, very little time to have any impact or to have any footprint whatsoever on any any policy documents or anything like that. And I mean, he is bound within the terms of the, the three-party agreement anyway, so he's tied in there. He's tied in by budgetary constraints. There isn't a lot he can do, but he, he, he can talk a lot. Uh, is he better than Leo Varadkar? Is he not? Is he too young? All of these issues will, will, will unravel and, and, and sort themselves out. Uh, it'll take a few opinion polls to see what, what the general public, uh, how they're rating them. Uh, so far from what we've seen from the independent poll, uh, his rating is not going to lift the party I all think that I much. Would, uh, if I were advising him, you know, I think really you, if you're going to try and be angry, you know, and shaking the fist and furrow the brow, that, that kind of has to be how you're perceived or you have to be able to pull that off. And I think just maybe he might struggle to do that. I think his advisors should try... Should try uh, and get him to stick to, to what he, he might be good at and not trying to be something that he's not because, again, uh, I, I really do think it's a big mistake to under, underestimate the public. Uh, just before I let you go, John, the uh, local elections now, uh, just over two months away, aren't they? Yeah, eight weeks from Friday. Eight, eight weeks from Friday. What are they going to be run on? Because are they going to be run on some of the issues that we've been talking now or, or is it about personalities or is it about families that always had voted a certain way? Is there? Is, do you think there's any likelihood of a, a political seismic shift just in Donegal, let's focus, across our, our county? Or when you look at it, you can sort of see the regular faces that are, are probably almost guaranteed, aren't they, to get their seats? And we might have a few interesting uh, battles for the final one or two seats, or do you see it completely differently? What I would see this time around is that the Mikey Redress Party will shake things up a little bit. To what extent the will in any shown, possibly in Letter Kenny, there's a candidate in Mulford. I don't know many others. I haven't been talking to Ali Farron in a few weeks. But Micah is one of the issues that's been mentioned literally on a daily basis. And there are people out canvassing for the Micah candidates that would never have been canvassed in their lives before. That is going to have a difference here in Donegal. To what extent, we're not going to be quite sure of that. But local elections will always be, be fought on 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 the personalities because we know them we know the councillors uh, and there's claims there that they've done nothing in Lifford for the past five years which is absolutely lying and untrue councillors work pretty hard but it's very hard to achieve progress uh, within the department of, of of government because things work very very slowly people will say we're not building enough housing as that's the councillors are doing their best to improve that to lobby that it's a long, long, hard slog being a councillor. And I know councillors are running this time who would prefer not to be running, but they put their names in there anyway. They're there 20 years or more. They get very little thanks for it from the public, to be quite honest with you. But the numbers of meetings that they are obliged to attend, long, dreary meetings, it's all on government issues and government policies, like you'd be talking about housing, like you'd be talking about the infrastructure or whatever else. It's very, very hard to, to mobilise a local government they give it their best shot. That's all they can do. I would never have any complaint with the councillor. I, I, I ring them quite regularly to, to lobby for something, and they're there to talk to you. They're okay. there to talk to the public. But this notion that councillors are doing nothing in Lufford is a lie, absolutely a lie. Okay, right. All right, John, listen, thanks very much indeed. I do appreciate your time, and we'll chat again really soon, I'm sure. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Greg. Right, bye. Good morning. But good morning to you, um, John McAteer. I mean, John's starting to part in our opinions. I don't know. Uh, no, I'm only messing. Uh, 0866 25,000 is the WhatsApp and text number. 0866 25,000. Or give us a call in 07491 25,000. Your emails uh, to comments at highlandradio.com. If you want to send in a voice note, by the way, on your WhatsApp app, uh, then hold down the microphone key and send it in to us and uh, we can play it out or at least listen to it. Right, we'll be back uh, with the weather forecast. The Nine Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union. Digital loans now available. Apply online or via our app today and get your loan transferred directly to your current account. Lorraine, what's the story with all the Pat the Baker sourdough packs framed on your wall? What? They're my diplomas. Diplomas? I've taken a lot of tests, you know, for deliciousness, for freshness, for flavour, for taste. Sorry, tests. You need to butter up your act and take the crusty craving taste test with the new Pat the Baker sourdough bread. Go on, be a taste champion. Pat the Baker, so fresh it's famous. Pat the Baker, fresh it's famous. 
The Nine Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union with monster loans available up to €60,000 for all occasions. Visit letterkennycu.ie. Sleep under the stars at one of Ireland's top glamping destinations, Loch Mardell Lodge in South Donegal, offering Lakeside Eco Lodge with luxury yurts and shepherd's huts. Perfect for a family getaway or a romantic escape. Get 10% off with discount code MARDEL for bookings made by end of April. To book, call 086 02 3360 or visit lochmardellglamping.ie. If you're tired and struggling to put a spring in your step, discover the power of Revive Active at your local Brennan's Pharmacy. Revive Active is an award-winning super supplement containing 26 active ingredients, including vitamin C, D and zinc, which support your immune system, all in one handy daily sachet. Made for busy, stressful lives, it's the convenient way to put back what life takes out. Enrich your life with Revive Active. In-store or online, click and collect from brennanspharmacy.com. We're here for you. Party Box Legends of County Mayo with Three Bucks Left is packed with satire, comedy and poignant reflections. Catch Three Bucks Left, one of Ireland's favourite comedy shows at Villa Rose Ball Buffet on April 18th, the Waterside Arts Theatre Derry on April 19th and on Green Ant Theatre Letterkenny on May 3rd. See venues for ticket information. It's time to visit Ireland's newest Lexus dealership, Lexus Letterkenny. With 50 years of experience, you can trust us in this new era of electrification. Experience our all-electrified range, including the stunning ES Hybrid Saloon and our award-winning range of plug-in hybrid SUVs. And view our finance offers, including the all-new LBX. Start your 241 journey with Lexus Letterkenny Port Road. Lexus. Experience amazing. The Lotto Jackpot is an estimated 7.8 million euro. Play responsibly in store, in app, or at lottery.ie. The National Lottery. It could be you. Highland Radio weather updates with McElhenney's. Support local at McElhenney's. With 53 years' experience in fashion, beauty, and home, we're here for you. Plus, enjoy M card rewards when you shop in store at McElhenney's Bally Buffet. Cloudy and misty today without breaks of rain and jizzle, uh, drizzle. Persistent for a time in the morning and again later in the afternoon and evening. Some of it will be heavy, becoming breezy and it'll be mild with uh, highest temperatures of 12 to 15 degrees. Derek Viles, Director of Tourism and Expeditions with Tour Donegal and Tour Ireland Guide. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, Derek. I've, did I get your titles correct there, yeah? Uh, well, you know, that'll, that'll do for now. I have different hats on, but uh, today I'm just a local resident. Uh, yes, with an interest in tourism, taxi and buses, uh, bringing Ukrainians and international to the iPad Centre in Dublin, uh, from Mount Street uh, to schools, everything. So I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm probably the right man to be uh, talking about this today, I hope, anyway. All right. Okay. Now you right. you've been expressing your opinions, uh, I suppose, uh, on on our uh, hosting of uh, IPAS refugees in Donegal and beyond. What's your view? Um, I've been expressing it for quite some time, so it's not today or this month. I've been in talks uh, behind the scenes with government. And with County Council, and thankfully with whistleblowers within both IPAS and uh, Donegal County Council for about, since I've done a letter to the Irish Times on the 7th of February last year, it was podcasted by Night of Delaney at Ocean FM on the 9th. People can go and have a look at that so we don't have to cover the same information, hopefully, i.e. that I'm a racist or I have an agenda. Um, I also did an interview and it's podcasted with Ocean FM on these matters on the 5th, I think it was uh, the Thursday, the 15th. Yeah, with all due uh, respect, with all, with all due respect, Derek, that's in a different area, different radio station. We invited you on to discuss it on this radio station. Mm. It was strange to be signposting elsewhere to avoid talking about it here. Uh, but you, you've been responding, yep. have you, to the government's... Uh, commitments or aspirations to do something uh, about immigration in this country I presume you don't believe them to be uh, you, you don't believe you don't have much faith in them is that the case or what is your actual view yeah 
I'm sorry for using that as a broadcast. I apologise for that. Greg, I, I haven't on, been on with you, but what I'm trying to say is I don't agree with how this has been handled, mm-hmm. and I haven't agreed with it for a while. I sent into your uh, show um, the letter that's in the endo last week. Yeah. Um, if you want, uh, for your readers, just to understand where I'm coming from, I could read that. It's only take one, one 30 seconds to a minute. Donegal has done much to help displace people, but collective well is now dry. We in Donegal look forward to the implementation of the Integration Minister's latest repackaged plans of not using the last hotel and amenity in many of our overstretched and bemused communities. We take with a pinch of salt his aspiration of committing to rebuilding trust in the immigration system and distributing housing fairly around the country, while conversely and yet again unsustainably doubling the the reliance on the commercial and private accommodation sector like our remaining hotels onto 2028, four years from now. In the meantime, take note that Donegal, out in front and leading the pack, is housing at twice the national average for IPAS immigrants. With half our hotel beds already gone to this use, we won't be betting these efforts work or hoping the Minister recognises we have staked and surpassed our regional quotas already. Our collective well has truly run dry in Donegal. Dublin will just have to dig its own pool deeper from here on in. Our communities won't be fooled again by castles in the sky, nor place bets on such frozen horse policies with the same old odds offered by also ran ministers in their final furlong. I wrote that uh, uh, the week before last, yeah. and that's what I sent into your yeah. show. show. Um, so uh, that's really, uh, Greg, I suppose that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay. So, so just just for for uh, uh, to, to verbalise that, uh, are you criticising the government up until now, saying you've no faith uh, in what they might do into the future? Are you looking for a review of 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 the hosting of I pass uh, refugees uh, yes, in exactly, Donegal? Exactly. You could. Uh, Greg, thank you. You you hit the nail on the head. I couldn't have put it better. Uh, I, 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 I use the first minute to say that I've been doing this quietly and slowly, but in public and in the national press and on the radios. Uh, it's not a response to an iPad centre. Uh, being, we're told yesterday setting up in Killy Beggs um, this coming week. Um, it's exactly what you said. I've been calling uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the Attorney General to get a grip on this, for the uh, Ross Fanning. To, uh, before he's put out of a job after Leo goes. Um, also, the uh, controller and auditor general, um, Fina Falls man, for the complete and utter waste of billions of euros, uh, particularly in Donegal, Kerry, and Amona, and making millionaires uh, out of it. I am a tour guide, as you introduced me. I spend a lot of time seeing how many millionaires per square mile are in Donegal with the fishing. Now I'm going to have to add in with the refugee crisis. That's on the back of wars and famine and, 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 and major problems in the world. I understand that. Uh, but, you know, Killy Beggs shouldn't have to take the brunt of that. Well, I, well, your last speaker, I didn't quite catch his name. Was it John somebody? Was John McIntyre of the Tribune. John Tribune. Oh, John spoke wonderfully. And, and again, it's very hard. John mentioned 12,000. Um, I was listening to what you were both saying, and I concur with both of you, uh, particularly what you said, Greg. It's, it's not about the 12,000 empty houses. It's about the 12,000 extra people uh, arriving here without one extra doctor, without uh, an extra bus, without an extra anything. And before anything they said that their extra bus service is put on, uh, you know, they were put on. Uh, a long time ago, uh, you know, the figures that I was looking at uh, are two and a half, uh, 1,600 Ukrainians two years ago when these services were put on. We have eight or 9,000 Ukrainians, and we probably, at a guess, four or 5,000 international protection in the county in the last two years. You know, we're a small, I'm writing a, 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 a guide to southwest Donegal and a larger one to Donegal for tourism. So I ring departments and I say, what figure do I use? Do I use the 20, two, two, thousand, two years ago figure uh, for 166,000, up uh, 4,000 from 2016 census, or do I use the new 12 or 13,000 But just figure? out of interest, you know Derek, but, but why, yeah. why uh, and this is just a curiosity, I'd ask you if we weren't on the radio, what 
uh, to tourism, if you're doing a tourist guide and, and, and welcoming people to Donegal, presumably talking about, you know, uh, beautiful Bundor and Donegal Town, Schlieve League, Ironmore, Burtonport, what are you talking, why would you be talking to tourists about the number of uh, Ukrainian refugees or IPAS residents in Donegal? How does that tie in with your, with your tour guide? Great question. I wish you were on one of my tours today. Um, the first page of my a guide says the population of County Donegal is 167,000, plus or minus 12,500. That's what the government want me to say, because these people are not staying here. They're going. Well, I'm talking to these people as a taxi man, as a bus man, as a community representative. Uh, some of these people are in uh, picking litter off the street in some of the groups I'm involved in. They're in the heritage group. They're not going anywhere. They are staying here. They're, they're marrying people. They're buying houses. This is in this area. This is the reality. We have to get a grip on this. So in my book uh, and on my tours, National Geographic come in here. The first thing they say is, what does Kelly Beggs mean? How many live here? And how many live in Donegal? And what does Dune and All mean? So I have to explain everything. It's the fort of the foreigner. It's the, the town of the little cells. That's, you know, I have to be precise and I update every year my fa facts and figures. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm not being facetious mm -hmm. with you, Greg, or to your listeners. I'm just saying, what is Derek Vile to do on Browns of this? They're waiting on me to come back to him uh, this week, probably last week. Do I say the population of County Donegal is 167,000 plus or minus 12,500? Because they're going home, the government tells us. Or do I tell them the reality? And what the, what? There's an extra 13,000 people what, what, here. What do the tourists say to this? Some of them probably not with fantastic English. Like, are they going... Uh, did... Oh, they all, they all have fantastic English. They all have fantastic English. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, okay. it doesn't matter what part of the world they're coming uh, do you, you know, the Ukrainians I'm doing with fantastic English. Uh, you know, they understand exactly. They want to know. People want to know how many people live in Kelly Bags. Do I tell them 1,200 people, or do I tell them the extra 300 that are here? Do I tell them there's a new iPad centre coming uh, this week with we're told 22 in in six bedrooms? Uh, if that's anything to be believed uh, from my sources, six bedroom houses in Loch Inure and 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 Dunlow. Started with uh, 15 to 20 and half 30 to 40 on it, but no extra services. Mm. You hit the nail on the head. No extra doctors, no extra transport. He, the, the, the people, and I say 100% give the people coming to Donegal. Like, I am an ambassador for Donegal. I always will be. I, I have to even debate with my own brother, George Vile, that he interviewed last year. Uh, I think you had him on the show you know, he's questioning my uh, integrity on this matter. So I had to say to him by text just before I came on well, your show. Well, can I just say, I'm just, just, uh, Derek, just, 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 I, I just, I, I tell you, George isn't here. I, I can't remember who George is just at the moment, but it's just maybe easy to keep that between yourselves on the text rather than, than uh, hammering it out on the radio with respect. It's just I, I can't sort of... Uh, you, yeah, I know that. You referencing, uh, my, 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 my you referencing someone yeah, else's my point, point of view. I, I just, I, I, I listen, jo I, Derek. I, f I fully understand where you're coming from, and I understand that your role, the role you have in in, in tourism and and tourism and selling, uh, uh, selling uh, Donegal, which is great. Mm. Uh, the, the the way you combine them is seems a little bit unique to me, but uh, that's that's your choice, Derek. And you have your concerns, and I have to go for the ten o'clock news. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for sending us in the letter, and have a good day. Greg, I appreciate your time. All have right, a good take day. care. Bye bye. Okay, oh eight six sixty twenty five thousand is the WhatsApp and text number, or call oh seven four nine one twenty five thousand. I just needed a little time as well before the news uh, to tell you that the phone lines are down in Tamney Health Centre this morning. I'm told if you're trying to get through, uh, the Tamney Health Centre, by the way, is in Fanad, but if you were trying to get through, you would know that anyway. If you need to get through to the doctors, please call the following number. Uh, you can either call in, by the way, or call the following number, 086-896-8089, before 1pm today. Now, 
obviously you're not going to have a pen probably to hand just to take that number down. So if you need the number for the Tamney Health Centre in Fanad, give us a buzz and one of the team will pass it on to you. Uh, their phone lines are down at the moment. Uh, so you might be trying to get through thinking they're not answering, but the case is that it's a technical uh, issue. All right, so that's that. 086 60 25,000. One more time just to remind you of that number. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more after the news and obituary notices here on the 9 till noon show. The 9 till noon show with Letterkenny Credit Union. Now offering mortgages from 40,000 to 600,000 euro with no hidden fees or transaction charges. Letterkenny Credit Union 9102127. Two opportunities are now available at Zen Heron Beauty in Letterkenny. One is a chair to rent for a stylist and the other is a room and nail table also available to rent. If you're looking for a change and would like to be located in Letterkenny, call 91204000 or email zenheronbeauty at gmail.com. Peppa Pig is back in Derry in her oinktastic brand new live show, Peppa Pig's Fun Day Out. Join your favourites for some fabulous adventures and enjoy all the fun, giggles and snorts. Don't miss it on the 15th and 16th of May. Book now at millenniumforum.co.uk. Tee off your Masters Week with unbeatable savings at McGurk's Golf Letter Kenny. From the 8th of April to the 15th of April, swing by our store and score big. For every €100 Euro spent, you'll receive a €10 Euro McGurk's Golf voucher. Take advantage of this limited offer during Masters Week. Visit McGurk's Golf located at Letterkenny Retail Park, your go-to destination for top quality golf equipment and at unbelievable prices. Do you need a little extra help staying in your home? At Bluebird Care, we offer a wide variety of QMARC-approved personalised home care services across Donegal. And our fully trained and committed staff will always meet your care needs with kindness, compassion and dignity. To get your personal home care assessment plan, visit bluebirdcare.ie or call our care team today on 07491 29562 and bring care home. Only two days left until the big home makeover draw in association with Foy & Company. If you're in, you can completely transform your home with our €10,000 home makeover plus €5,000 in cash. All in association with Foy & Company. Go to highlandradio.com to purchase your tickets and we could be calling you. Entries close this Friday at 12 noon. Online and on the Highland Radio app. This is Highland Radio News. Good morning, it's 10 o'clock. Donald Kavanagh at the news desk. Disappointment has been expressed in relation to the potential stalling of a tourism development project at Fort Dunree. Councillor Rena Donaghy is on the committee overseeing the development at the fort. She says objectors have put a spanner in the works with on board Planada now seeking an environmental impact assessment, even though the initial expert advice was such a study wasn't needed and there was a comprehensive public consultation. She says extra costs will now be incurred, price increases will have an impact and the whole €12 million Euro project could be delayed for years. Councillor Donaghy fears the whole development could potentially be compromised. We were told at our municipal meeting that an environmental impact study is required because unfortunately we seem to have a few serial objectors in Bunquana. These people have objected to Cockhill Bridge, they've objected to uh, the redevelopment of Swan Park and now there's an objection and to the military museum. This could push the project back two years or we could even lose it completely after gaining £12.5 million. Donegal County Council is being urged to provide serviced sites in the Lifford Stranoller Municipal District with a view toward providing them to young middle-income earners under an affordable housing scheme. Councillor Patrick McGowan told a municipal district meeting this week that a lot of progress is being made regarding the provision of social housing with work starting on several projects across the area in the coming months. However, he says the young middle-income earners who can't get onto the property ladder at the moment need support. The council is currying currently carrying out a survey to determine the need for affordable housing initiatives and Councillor McGowan is urging the council 
to start planning. There is a public consultation ongoing at the moment to measure the demand there is for affordable housing and how that's going to be delivered. But I think within the county development plan that's, that's about to be adopted and also the area plans for Bunkrana, Bundoran and Balbafe, we need to specify which of these zone sites is going to be for affordable houses. Contact Irish Water, contact all the other services and say, will they deliver the services in now in time? Because we just can't be planning for the next two or three, four years. We need to do it now. Phone lines are down at the Tammany Health Centre in Fanad this morning. If anyone needs to get through to the doctors, they're asked to call in or to dial 086 896 8089 before one o'clock this afternoon. That's 086 896 8089. Insurance companies will come under renewed pressure to lower premia after new personal injuries guidelines were given the go-ahead by the Supreme Court. The ruling comes three years after the new guidelines, which would see lower payments for certain injuries, were first introduced. The CEO of the Alliance for Insurance Reform is Brian Hanley. The new guidelines that came in provided much greater specificity in terms of the injuries and the awards, providing for greater consistency in awards. And it also, whilst ensuring people were appropriately compensated, had the desirable effect of reducing awards in personal injury cases, bringing them more into line with those awarded in other countries. Taoiseach Simon Harris's focus today will be on the appointment of new junior ministers. He hosts his first cabinet meeting this morning. There weren't many changes when it came to the appointment of ministers yesterday, with only three adjustments to cabinet. Jennifer Carl McNeil is the new Minister of State for European Affairs. She says the Taoiseach chose a team that will best tackle his main priorities. No matter what he did, somebody was going to criticise him, and there are very few spots available. Peter Burke is a fantastically strong, solid worker. I think he will bring a really good perspective to the Department of Enterprise, Patrick O'Donovan and Limerick West. The conversations around farming, the conversations around the concerns of rural Ireland are hugely important to Fine Gael and I think it's fantastic to have Patrick at Cabinet table now to be able to articulate and reflect some of those, those concerns. Donegal County Council has agreed to carry out a safety review on the road at Leck Graveyard in Letterkenny. There's been ongoing concern over the speed at which vehicles are travelling on that stretch. The authority has also agreed to install a sign advising motorists that they are approaching a graveyard. Councillor Donald Coyle has called for traffic calming measures as well at the nearby model crash. He says it's time action was taken in both locations. There's not even a sign on either side to say that there is a graveyard there. The layout of the road, that's very wide at the graveyard. Traffic calming measures has to be carried out there to slow down cars and then further on at the model play school. The, the council have to seriously consider ramps with the amount of traffic that's there with parents dropping off children busy at all times during the day I'm pleading with the council to do something in relation to that Weather forecast cloudy and misty today. Outbreaks of rain and drizzle, they'll be persistent for a time in the morning and again late in the afternoon and evening. Some of that rain will be heavy. It'll be breezy and mild with top temperatures this afternoon of 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. And that's Highland Radio News. We're back with news headlines again at 11. Check all of today's news, of course, on our website, highlandradio.com. But for now, from the news team, good morning. The obituary notices for this Wednesday morning, the 10th of April. The death has taken place of Patricia Gillen, 51 Brook Hill, Coolmore Road, Derry. Her remains will repose at her home from 1 o'clock this afternoon. Funeral from there on Friday morning at 10 to 11. For half past 11, Requiem Mass in St Columbus Church, Longtar. Cremation will take place at Lakeland's Crematorium, Cavan, on Saturday. Family time, please, from 10pm to 11am. Donations in lieu of flowers if desired to the Foyle Hospice. The death has taken place of Julie McLaughlin, 1 O'Callaghan Court, Pier Road, Rathmullen. Reposing at her home in Rathmullen from 8 o'clock this evening. Funeral Mass on Friday morning at 11 in St Joseph's Church, Rathmullen. Burial afterwards in Rathmullen Cemetery. The Funeral Mass can be viewed on MCN Media. Family time please from 10pm to 10am and on the morning of the funeral. Family flowers only, please. The death has taken place of Joe Curley, Meherard Mallon. Joe's remains are now reposing at the home of Margaret McCall, Meherard. Funeral from there on Friday morning at half past ten for 11 o'clock funeral mass in St Patrick's Church, Ahutley, with burial afterwards in the adjoining graveyard. Rosary Knightley at 10pm. 
the Deaf Hastigan Place of Bridie Cullen, 28 Orchard Drive, Donegal Town, late of Ballantra and London. Funeral Mass this morning at 11 in St Bridget's Church, Ballantra, with burial afterwards in the adjoining cemetery. The funeral mass can be viewed on churchservices.tv. The Deaf Hastigan Place of Alec Kerr, formerly of Bally R and Trumaboden. His remains are reposing at Letcher Presbyterian Church. Funeral service there this afternoon at 2 o'clock, followed by interment in the adjoining burial ground. Family flowers only please. Donations in lieu of desired to the Lake House Comfort Fund, care of Fonzie McElwee, funeral director. The death has taken place of Una Burns, 26 Brookvale, Strabam, reposing at her home. Funeral from there tomorrow morning at 20 past nine for Requiem Mass in St Mary's Church, Melmount at 10 o'clock. Interment afterwards in the adjoining cemetery. Donations in lieu of flowers, please, to the Alzheimer's Society, care of Quigley Funeral Directors. Family time, please, from 11pm. The Requiem Mass can be viewed on melmountparish.com. And the death has occurred of Jimmy Foodie, 13 Mountain View, Balladurg, Letter Kenny. Requiem Mass in St. Eunan's Cathedral, Letter Kenny, at 11 o'clock this morning, with burial afterwards in Conwell Cemetery. The funeral mass can be viewed on churchservices.tv. Donations in lieu of flowers, please, to Leukemia Research, care of any family member or Bradley O'Doherty funeral directors. House private, please, before the funeral this morning. For family information and more details regarding wakes and funerals, please go to highlandradio.com. Every year, about 2,600 people in Ireland get bowel cancer. Bowel screening helps to reduce your risk of developing it. The age range for bowel screen is changing. If you're aged 59 to 69, register for a free bowel screen test kit. Once you've done the test at home, return it by free post and we'll test your sample. If you need follow-up tests, we let you know. Register today at bowelscreen.ie or free phone 1800 45 45 55 from the HSC. And now, Imro's 2023 Best Local or Regional News Programme, The Voice of the Northwest, The Nine Till Noon Show, with Greg Hughes. You're very welcome back to the programme. Uh, good morning if you're just after uh, joining us. Uh, right, some of your comments coming in so far this morning. Greg, I watched an excellent Channel 4 programme the other night, Defiance, fighting the far right, re-Britain's Asian immigrants from 76 to 81. It was scary to see the similarities to many Irish people now in 2024, all the same old excuses given as a disguise for racism. Greg, I think that figure of the number of people in Donegal is well and truly wrong. What about our young people? Do they count in that? I doubt so, because most of them are gone. Well, I think there is a, an, an awful lot of people have emigrated. I wouldn't say most, but anyway, be that as it may, the uh, population of Donegal is based on... Um, is based on... Um, I can't think of what you actually do every couple of years. I can't actually think of the word. It'll come to me now in a second. Uh, there's a water outage in Bunkrana, by the way, in case some people don't know. Uh, there's a bust pipe. OK, so that's it. Census is the word. Census, I beg your pardon. Do you know what? Sometimes you just go blank on a word for no reason. Uh, census. So the 160... Uh, I don't know what the last census figure were. I think it's it was 167, 168, up from 157, 158. Um, that is the population, and it doesn't account in real... Uh, it doesn't account live for those that are leaving or coming into the country or county. Uh, can you please ask your listeners about tickets for the first round of the championship, Donegal v Derry, on the 20th of April? Where can I get to when we are not club members? I'll just chuck that out rather than uh, taking a guess at it. So uh, a listener's not a club member, not a member of any GEA club, where can they get tickets for Donegal v Derry on the 20th of April? My child says a listener was unable to secure accommodation in a third-level college and delayed attendance for a year as all housing was occupied by immigrants. Following year, she didn't get a course but paid... Uh, she did, uh, didn't get her course but paid exorbitant rent. OK, she did get a course, I wonder, the following year. Uh, another caller says, Greg, there have been reports of incidents that have occurred. Maybe it's time for a change to be introduced at On Green On, just like many national monuments. Well, that's the fear, isn't it? 
A caller says a survey a survey should be put out to show how well areas in Donegal could cope with an influx of people, what services they have, schools, amenities, housing. Uh, this would solve the immigration crisis. It's not that we don't want people here. We just don't necessarily have the resources in some areas. Uh, the country not full, as John McAteer said in the first hour. God save us from this attitude. Casualty is full. Tent capacities are full as houses handed over to immigrants. Post offices full of benefit claimants. Dentists are full. GPs are full. Schools are full. We've all let too many in, and it's not just being. It's not just a Ukrainian. Stop being obtuse, says the listener. Uh, completely out of touch with local people around here. I'm not sure what that's uh, referencing. Maybe if you could uh, just text in a little bit more there. Many of the people coming here are being deported from other European countries. Well, not many. There is stats out there. Um, some of them are. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there is an issue with, uh, and it was recognised, and maybe it is many. Um, and Leo Varadkar talked about this before he uh, uh, headed off into the sunset politically, I suppose you could say, is that um, he wants them returned, I think, uh, paraphrasing there. The question everyone is asking is why Ukrainians are guaranteed housing and income while we have 13,000 homeless Irish people? Why are asylum seekers from Ukraine treated differently to asylum seekers from Africa or Asia? John won't address that. Well, I suppose in terms of the 13,000 homeless, they're in emergency accommodation. That is the, the housing that they're, they're offered. Uh, Ukrainians, for the most part, are in uh, grouped accommodation, aren't they? Though at this stage, a lot of them, uh, many of them have been able to move out and compete in the private uh in the private market and of course there is a difference then as to how asylum seekers are uh, treated uh, ukraine are refugees rather than asylum seekers a few years ago some people were labeled as far right by government by opposing uh, by opposition and media for pointing out the obvious problems with unlimited immigration i think that gets trotted out as such and you sort of saw it the same as covid uh, at the time of covid in that you know when you maybe are, are very specific in your point of view. You think you're the only one talking about it and everyone is ignoring you. Uh, I know from the get-go, from the very first time uh, before, I'll tell you, I could even name the hotel and I could name the town when people were coming in. And at that point, uh, on that very first day before a single person had arrived in this county on this programme, we were expressing uh, points of view or concerns or platforming concerns that take this this hotel being uh, decommissioned as a tourism hotel would be detrimental to that area of the town and the local shops and cafes and what have you so before a single person arrived in this county uh, that conversation was being uh, had here in a fair and balanced way Greg, following the coronation of our latest Taoiseach yesterday, all that remains now is for him and Micheál Martin to agree on a new name for the new party. I can't wait to see how they're going to campaign when the election is called. They can't really attack each other as they are now pals for life. They'll probably just both go on uh, an all-out attack on Sinn Féin, who they both seem to hate and fear. Well, I, I think it's 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 likely that Micheál Martin and uh, Mary Lou MacDonald will be in government together in the next after the next election, if the current government is not re-elected. But I, they'll turn on each other, make no mistake about that, uh, as the election uh, comes closer. Um, it's a joke regarding the new doll, hand-picked Taoiseach, another public unelected leader. That is the third. Simon Harris was only elected on the 15th count at the last doll elections. If his own constituents had little faith in him, what chance do the rest of us have? All right, OK, going to take a break now. Uh, our next guest will be joining us very, very shortly. See, keep your calls and comments coming in. It's time for Vision Ireland Bingo on Highland Radio. It's Wednesday, April 10th. Playing on a blue sheet, reference number is S13. It's week 15. Today's numbers are 59, 45, 58, 86, 67 14 57 87 68 and 46 Phone your claim to 9104833 before 8 tonight leaving your name, contact number and the name of the shop where you purchased your book Get all your Vision Ireland bingo information at highlandradio.com if you're running for election, let BizPrint take care of all your printing needs. BizPrint's experience can help you towards a successful campaign. Be election ready by calling BizPrint the printers on 9177955. 
Are you on the lookout for a new challenge? Here at Century Complex, we are seeking an innovative and dynamic leader to become a core part of our leadership team. The ideal candidate will support the team in the day-to-day -day operations of Century Complex as it expands. Send your CV to jobs at centurycinemas.ie now. Mike Denver in concert with guests Philomena Begley and Brendan Shine at the Millennium Forum Derry this Saturday, April 13th. Tickets on sale now at the Millennium Forum box office. That's Mike Denver with guests Philomena Begley and Brendan Shine at the Millennium Forum Derry this Saturday, April 13th. Don't miss a great concert. In the next 15 seconds, you're going to find out where is the best place in the Northwest to buy a bed or mattress. It's Restex Beds and Furniture Mountaintop, Letterkenny, where comfort meets style. The 9 Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union, offering low-rate car loans with fast approval. Apply online at letterkennycu.ie or in office today. In studio with me now is Neil Barrett, sports and exercise science lecturer in ATU Letterkenny, former gym owner of Fit Hub for over a decade, and uh, he's in studio with me. We're talking about a, a document we have in front of us, uh, Neil, Train for Life. Um, what's this about? Good morning to you. I did say good morning, didn't I? You did. Good morning. So, so what's this about? Um, this is essentially uh, an alliance of like-minded people, stakeholders, politicians, gym owners, healthcare professionals, and we're going to try and lobby the government to include uh, a gym membership tax rebate mainly um, for uh, individuals around the country. The, the main goal here is to try and increase the physical activity of the nation. Because um, that's important, obviously, isn't it? Oh, and, and, uh, and I suppose the argument is, as it often is with things to do with health, you spend a euro now and save 10 down the line. Well, actually, the McKenzie Report, <clears throat> Canada and Sweden imp implemented a very similar policy. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and they showed that there was a four euro return on investment for yeah. every one euro spent. Okay. Um, it's, 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 it's getting people to sort of recognise that, though, is the issue. Yeah. Uh, is, so there is precedent for this in other countries, isn't it? Uh, have, have we uh, have we figured out how much of a barrier finances are to people sort of joining a gym or getting into training, if you know what I mean? Because if it's a big barrier, then this could have big impacts. But if it's if that's not maybe the core reason why people aren't joining a gym or doing more exercise, then it, it could be a wasted exercise. Well, according to the evidence, it's the second biggest barrier. Number one is time. Yeah. Uh, and number two is cost. And actually, the number one reason people give up the gym is it's too expensive. Right. And it's, we're in a cost of living crisis at the minute as well. So when you're thinking about hitting your home and paying your rent or your mortgage and buying food, gym membership tends to fall by the wayside when yeah, it comes to this. Of course, because uh, people often make their personal sacrifices first, don't they? Yeah. And they might see this as one of those. So talk to me a little bit about the uh, the, the, the the document. It's not cheap. It's, it's quite accessible. Do you know what I mean? It's quite simple and all. Um, but the first sort of header is challenge a nation getting sicker due to physical inactivity. What's the science or what's the evidence telling us there? God, there's so much evidence. Um, well, I suppose, according to the government's own report, um, they started a, a government-funded initiative called the Healthy Ireland Initiative back in 2014 with the, the aim of, of getting people more physically active and mainly to reduce obesity. So as it stands right now, for every 10 people in this country, six and a half of them are either overweight or obese. And by 2030, that's eight out of 10. Mm. Um, we have an incredibly aging population as well. Um, people might argue we're living longer, but I would argue we're probably just dying more slowly. Um, mm. With advances in, in medicine, we're able to extend people's lives, but not their quality of life. So as we get older, we tend to get sicker. Um, and by the 2050, for the first time in human history, we'll have more over 65 than we will under 18s. Yeah. So our our health system is bursting at the seams. But presumably, just so there is you know, some, some optimism here, if we all were more active and more healthy, you know, through our lives, presumably then we would be uh, living longer and able to enjoy uh, the extra years that medicine is affording us. Yeah, exactly. And and that's it. It's, it's about being physically active. So when, when we look at the, I know it sounds very morbid, but the, the number one um, disease that we die of is cardiovascular disease, so heart disease and stroke. Um, that accounts for, that's number one, and it's it's more than number two, three, and four combined. Mm. 
Um, so that, that drives precedence for getting people more physically active. So our, our 30 minutes a day, our 150 minutes a week, that's exactly what we should do. But on the other side of things, um, muscular strength and, and bone density have a, a significantly negative impact on our health system as well. So muscle wastage and, and bones breaking as a result of brittleness and also not having enough muscular size or muscular strength. And we can't really achieve strength at home, but we can. But are we likely to? Probably not. Mm. So this is where having access to professionals and to gyms and communities uh, is very beneficial. Uh, and um, again, not to, to, to pee people off, but a quarter of the working age population, uh, which is presumably 18 to 67 or whatever it might be, yeah. uh, a, a quarter of the population is classified as inactive. Yeah. Now, that might come as a surprise to some people who believe they're not inactive, for an example. So how do we define a person as inactive? Just the amount of physical activity they do throughout the week. So if we're looking at less than 30 minutes of physical activity, either inside our job or outside of our job per week. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, one in four people are physically inactive. I wonder, will that increase with uh, the move to hybrid working? Um, or decrease, I don't know. Probably. Well, have you ever heard of the term our third place? Mm. So we have our first place, which is our work, and then sec or our home, sorry, our second place, which is our work. And for a lot of people now, they're the same. Um, and classically, in, in Irish history, our third place was the pub. That's where we went to socialise and to, to hang out with people. And it's starting to change ever so slightly, thank God, that the gym and, um, you know, sports and, and social groups are becoming our third place. Mm. So we're actually becoming less active. Our jobs aren't labour intensive anymore. If we go back to the 50s and 60s, we had very labour intensive jobs. But with the the growing use of technology and work, we sit most of the yeah, time. Most of, it's easy, most of the yeah, day. I think yeah. so. Uh, 1.5 billion is the annual cost of the state from inactivity. Yeah. 3.52 million lost work days due to sickness in 2022. Obviously, I don't imagine all of those could be attributed to what we've been talking about, can they? Or Not not all yeah. of them, no, but uh, a large uh, amount of those are through back pain. Yeah, okay, well, there you go. And core strength and what have you, I presume, would help to, to mitigate, uh, mitigate that. So uh, what is this country's current approach then? Uh, heavily involved in funding sport, which I, I'm a sports lecturer, so I'm, I'm a huge advocate for promoting sport. Um, both at the grassroots underage level and then at elite sport and everything in between. Um, but I, I think we need to at least match that for the general population who aren't involved in sport. Um, so, for example, we have 600,000 members of the GAA and nearly 60% of them stop uh, being actively involved in sport after secondary school. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge drop-off there. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with these people? We, we need to give them another avenue to try and be healthier and give them the, the ability to to train uh, in, in communities and not just have that physical benefit, but also the, the, the social and psychological benefit of working with people. Mm. So what we're doing is not working. Like, since the inception of the Healthy Iron Initiative in 2014, the government has managed to increase physical activity by 1%. That's a failure by any, failure. any measure. And obesity has either increased or remained the same. Yeah. So whatever we're doing, it's not working. So what we're trying to advocate for is we have we have 800 gyms around the country, nearly 14,000 employees, uh, which is accessible both in terms of urban and rural areas. So why not try and mobilise these to help people get more active? Yeah, because for people that are sporty and non-sporty, you know, they're at either end of the spectrum. Yeah. There's an awful lot there in between, isn't yeah, there? huge amount. That's not really talked about very much. Sport's not for everybody. And plus, yeah. even if it was, like, I, I would love to still be able to play sport. I'm 42 now. But if I went out to a football pitch you're or too old, a basketball dude. court... You'll do your knees in. My knees are gone. Oh, no, you're you know, you physically checked. can't compete. <laughs> no, no matter how much... And I've tried over the last couple of years, a few of my friends, we got together and tried to play in a couple of evenings. It's your hammy one week, it's your ankle exactly. the next. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and physically not able, just don't have the gas tank yeah. to keep doing that. Aye. So we need another outlet. Mm. And, and why not use what we have nationwide? We've ignored it. I've been on the sort of brink of wanting to go to join a gym. Yeah. Right, so uh, went to the GP thankfully not too bad you know but says you need to you know lose, lose a bit of timber uh your, your blood pressure's middling but you can certainly you know help by doing a bit more exercise but there's something and we'll get back to this report in a moment there's just something just something i can't overcome to do it i have the time right yeah. so it's not that i but i just i can't 
take that first step. What's going on? That's the that's the scariest part. That's huh? the that's the the scariest part for most people. Like I've actually gone to the point. Well, which gym would I go to? <laughs> would I go to that one? Or would I go to this one? Would I do it there? Would I do it there? And I've talked about it. And then it, uh, and then I'd be sitting there and I almost be fantasizing about. I have begun to go to the gym yeah. and I have started to feel the benefits of it, right? Because for years, the barrier to me going was that I'd be afraid of exercise and having a heart attack. I'm a weirdo, by the way, okay? But <laughs> but anyway, I, but I overcome that, right? Yeah. But I just don't... What What is stopping me from doing that? And it, going, seeing a, a, a personal trainer, having a couple of sessions, getting a really good sort of plan that I can do. So I'm not... I, I went once or twice before and I went running, then I did a bit of that, then I did... But never went back, right? Yeah. Because I never... I was never given any advice. What's stopping people like me from doing it? It's, it's not just people like you. It's the vast majority of people. Yeah. Um, it's the fear of judgment a lot of the time Ooh. for people going to the gym. Um, like even when, when I go into the gym myself, sometimes I would still have a fear of being judged. And I've worked in this industry for years, uh, especially among females. Females seem to have a real fear of judgment, mm. um, thinking that everybody's looking at them or watching them when they well, go in. Uh, there's actually something completely different here. And I don't know if you want to go into business with me or something, uh, but or if someone does. We need to change the clothing for exercise or have different types of clothing. Every piece of clothing is jammed right up your backside yeah. or pulled cr- tight across your chest or your stomach, right? Why is that? Why do we not have comfortable, exercise-acceptable, somewhat slightly loose-fitting stuff? It's very sexualized. Y- you know what I so mean? So it is, yeah. Isn't it? It, it really like, is, yeah. If you're going to the gym, you have to just... Everything has to be absolutely skin-tight and what have you. And that's fine. Some people are really comfortable with that. But why doesn't someone create clothing that is geared towards exercise but is comfortable and and um for those who are a bit self-conscious you know allows them to do it in a different way i think that's the that's the market though i mean if it's if, if people are buying this training gear the companies are going to produce it and mm. they're all about making profits so well i don't want that negativity around my business idea so i'm going to do it <laughs> <laughs> right now um yeah so I, I'm going to have to try and, and I, and I wouldn't mind, I interview so many people involved in gyms as well too. But anyway, so if uh, it's about getting people out, one of the barriers is uh, financial, the other's time. I think if we, if I think if we really sat down and scrutinised it, most of us could do the time. We have time. Right? We're talking not an awful lot, 20 minutes a day, something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, you can go 6am. Okay, so we can do, well, let's not get carried away in the early <laughs> doors, right? But so we, we have the time, so then it's yeah. a financial barrier. Yeah. So the proposal that there would be some sort of a rebate or what have you, yeah. how how might that work? Because it's kind of, it, it, it's, it, it's cost neutral to the government, really, if they take the right attitude towards it. It's cost benefit. To cost it. benefit, yeah. 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 Uh, well, there's already a, a, a process in place, the Med One form. Um, so it's essentially just you fill out the form, you show how much you're paying for your gym membership, and then you get a rebate based mm. on the tax bracket that you fall into. Um, so it's it's a very simple process, and it already exists. Uh, the, se- the second, uh, I suppose the second main point of the policy is actually trying to use the bike-to-work scheme mm. to help people who don't want to go to the gyms to buy gym equipment for their home or fitness wearables. So there's there's not just one thing. We're looking at five, but we're those are the main two. Yeah. Okay. And the back to uh, the cycle scheme is grand. I don't know how many people are actually using the bikes, and yeah. I think a lot of them are electric. I'm not saying that that doesn't have any benefit impact, but yeah. there you go. I would agree. So the benefits then, if if the government were to do this, whichever government, uh, in in terms of 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 physical health, in terms of of mental health. Uh, we talked about the economic benefits of it, a fall by return, isn't that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, uh, that's just just the benefit, general benefits to us as we get older, be it women in menopause or whatever it is, uh, whatever it might apply to fellas. Yeah. Uh, so what are you going to do with this document now? Well, we are going to Leinster House uh, the week after next. So we have uh, Senator Malcolm... Malcolm Doherty, I think. No, Regina Doherty and Malcolm Byrne actually oh, are, yeah. are drivers behind this. So we're going to the AV room in Leinster House to try and pitch this to a cross-party group and try and get them to include it in their budget for, for this year. And this is this is election time and this is voting time, so we would hope that when people are, are thinking about which direction their vote is going to go to, uh, maybe think about the party that is including this policy and their manifesto going forward. Because we, we don't have any agenda as a group or individually here. I don't own a gym anymore. It's of no benefit but to even me. Even if you did. Even if you did, it's yeah. still helping, you know, the, mm. the nation. Mm. Um, and basically, 
we're, we're, we've been trying to do something as a government and as a nation for the last 10, 15 years, and it's just not working. And you've demonstrated that yeah, uh, with, with the, the 2014 plan. Yeah. Um, and, and also, too, you know, everyone says the pressure on the health service, right? There's no silver bullet. It's this, it's that, it's the other. This also has to be factored into that as yeah. part of the solution to... Uh, easing pressure on the health service, particularly in a county like ours, whereby an awful lot of the uh, admissions to the hospital are respiratory in nature yeah. and what have you. You know what I mean? That's just a fact. Yeah. Um, it's it's not a guesswork. It is a fact. So anything we can do to strengthen our bodies, to strengthen our lungs, has to be beneficial. Yeah. Well, the the amount of money, as I said earlier, like the the, the healthcare system is bursting at the seams. So anything we can do to, to fix that mm. or to help uh, reduce the load on the healthcare system is obviously a positive. Mm. Now, it's not it's not an acute thing. This is going to be a long-term is, change, yeah. you know. But, I, I mean, it, it's very simple. It, it's going to benefit not just the, the health of the nation, but the money that is being spent on the healthcare system at the minute. If we can reduce that cost, that money then is surplus to be spent on other mm. things. It makes... Things Listen, the truth everybody. is, is the reluctance to invest more money in the health service. It's not that we don't have the money. Yeah. It's the, the the health minister the view that it will not make any difference yeah. because the health service is such a basket case. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, the sad reality of it. How important, asks a listener, is nutrition in the diet of teenagers and young adults, which isn't discussed enough, as a lot are eating fast foods more than they should be with little nutrition. A lot of brown foods out there, very little yeah, greenery. Uh, how true. important is that? Incredibly important. I mean, when we look at improving... So the number one reason why we get sick is because we're overweight. And the the number one way to reduce body fat percentage is to reduce our calorie intake and eat better foods and more whole foods. Um, the access that young people have to food nowadays, it's, it's at home for the most part. So it starts at home, having healthier choice at home. Uh, healthier parents show healthier children. So it really starts with us who have the money and who are in charge of what's being purchased mm. and the, the precedence we set in a, in a home environment. What should be on a plate in the evening, ideally? Uh, ideally, it, it hasn't really changed much in the last mm. 30, 40 years. You know, your meat, potatoes, vegetables, your, your rice, your chicken, your vegetables, or if you're inclined to be more um, uh, vegetable-based or plant-based, then more vegetables. Rice is good for you. Pasta seem to have, uh, be able to establish a reputation for being healthy. Yeah. Uh, it's not, though, is it? Pasta's not bad at all. Is I mean, not? pasta is essentially egg yolks and flour. It depends how it's made and the ingredients, obviously. Well, a wide deep fat fry mine. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's not no, much I, I can know. do for but, you there. You know, like with the advent of the air fryer as well, you know, yeah, you can chuck a lot of stuff in it and just tip it out and then you can sit down and watch the football yes, or can. whatever, you know. Uh, but but that, I think then sometimes we neglect to do the... the, the, the to get the good stuff onto the plate as well. Well, you know? again, as we said earlier on, one of the one of the things about people not being able to go to the gym is time, and also when it comes to eating healthy, sure. that also seems yeah. to be another thing is time. And quick, easy, heavily processed foods are much more accessible and cheaper. Yeah. So it's it's more expensive to eat healthily for the most part. Yeah. So we're putting barriers up there. And exactly. I think that's, that's a, another thing. To that's another issue. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. It's true. It is true because and, and you can see it because it's linked to uh, people with the lowest disposable income have the yeah. worst diets, and yeah. and and the reason if they worst diet it's often is because the the more processed the the worst foods is the cheapest food yes exactly um, okay all right so interesting so talk to me again you're going to present this uh, train for life you said for meeting down in the doll uh regina doherty's involved and malcolm Byrne. and malcolm Byrne. yeah uh, and whose ear do you have uh hopefully all the ears we have yeah. a, a group from cross parties coming in to listen now we we've heard um through the grapevine that this is a very good idea. They know that and they want to make this happen, mm. but we have to give them no doubt. And we need people who are gym members. Like there's 600,000 people in the country who go to the gyms. Yeah. So we need people in gyms to to use their votes because at the end of the day, whoever has the best policy for change are the people yeah. who get the votes. Because this hopefully. not only encourages people, uh, this not only encourages maybe new people to join gyms, it also has a, a financial benefit those that are there. Exactly. And it's cost not even just cost neutral, it's cost benefit to the yeah. country. Okay. And, but also on that point, I yeah. mean, if we, we currently have 16% of the population who go to the gym. Mm. If we can get that to 25%, that becomes the social norm. It's a tipping point. Mm -hmm. And that grows exponentially. 
So it has a, a huge net benefit for everybody going forward. It would be really interesting to see, you know, you talked about the 1% decrease or increase. No, Less than 1% increase in physical activity. In physical activity from 2014. What years. was that plan called again? It's the Healthy Ireland. The Healthy Ireland plan. It would yeah. be really interesting to see over five to ten years if this were introduced, what impact it yeah. would have. The proof would be in the pudding, exactly, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, but don't eat too much pudding. All right, then. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. Uh, continued success as sports and exercise science lecturer in the ATU. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, coming up and joining joining us tra and uh, talking training for life. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Watch the show live now on YouTube, Facebook and at highlandradio.com. The Nine Till Noon Show with Letterkenny Credit Union. Simplify your debts with a debt consolidation loan from Letterkenny Credit Union. Call us on 074-910-2126 or apply online via our app or in office today. Enjoy summer with Home Store and more. Bring your garden to life with our great range of garden furniture, including rattan corner sets, dinner sets, and much more. And when it comes to barbecues, whether gas, charcoal, or smoker, we've got what you need to cook up a storm. There's also gazebos and garden decor. Light up your garden with our extensive range of solar lights, string lights, post lights, lanterns, and much more. Make your garden your sanctuary. Come visit our stores and see for yourself, or shop online at homestoreandmore.ie. Home Store and More. A happy home. Visit Inishon Co-op Home Build Show at Inishon Gateway Hotel, Bonkrana on Saturday, April 13th, 11 to 5 p.m. Meet the suppliers for expert advice and all your home build needs. MICA supports available on the day. See Facebook for details. At Holland & Barrett, we believe it's time to change the way we think about our hormones. We've heard for too long, you're hormonal, but that's normal. Let's learn how to work together with our hormones so we're united in our quiet days, high days, what's happening to me days, the wonders of life days. Because when we understand our rhythm, we can own every day of the month. Find personalised solutions to support your hormone health. Now on 3 for 2 at Holland & Barrett. Offer ends 14th of May, subject to availability. Ryan Adams is back on tour in 2024. Join Highland Radio on our trip to Dublin to see the man himself at the Three Arena on Tuesday the 21st of May 2024. Your trip includes luxury transfers, bed and breakfast at the four-star Carton Hotel Blanchestown, your standing ticket to the show and a shopping trip to Dublin City Centre the following day. Find out more on the outlet at highlandradio.com or call us on 074 9125 5,000. The Nine Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union. Digital loans now available. Apply online or via our app today and get your loan transferred directly to your current account. Are you building, rebuilding or renovating? What heat pumps or solar panels would suit your build? Come along and speak to the experts. Efficient renewables on heat pumps and solar panels. Get advice on installation and grants available. Visit the Efficient Renewable showroom in Newton Cunningham and see these products in operation for yourself. If you need a new laptop, enjoy super fast performance and seamless multitasking with Avita laptops at Ben Sweeney Euronix. Avita laptops are equipped with advanced processors and ample RAM, so they handle everything from work to entertainment with ease. They come with a two-year warranty, and prices starting at only €449. Euros. For more details, pop in and see us at Ben Sweeney Euronix, Port Road Letter Kinney, or in the shopping centre, Dunlow. If you're with FBD Insurance and your van gets robbed, it's not a flippin' bloomin' disaster. That's not what FBD stands for. FBD stands for support. We support van owners like you by covering your work tools up to the value of 500 euro if they're stolen with your van. FBD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. Visit your local branch to talk to your FBD Insurance team. Requires valid van theft claim. Excludes electronics and software. T's and C's and normal underwriting criteria apply. Underwritten by FBD Insurance PLC. FBD Insurance Group Limited, trading as FBD Insurance, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Chaktark Bubbly Ochorli Kondai Winanal. Beglantahan Moor Winanal Ek Tarli Don Orkti Blianimliana Agas is Kaso Gomeshin Y Small Nario. Tarama Agas Kaji Lane Edge Lan Agas Glassy Enu De Winanal Le Konion Le Hebron Agas Le Kurcha Horsharhi If Fihipihi Keher. On Claru Del Glantahan Moor Winanal Kerglia or Nod Sharta Keher Ni Heen Quick Tree Ni Nodj Nodj. Wolisha Hoik Dafa Gudurish Echul Notur Kurch or Donegal Coco Ponkai. 
Pedro La Clara Freshing, Dactis Blantaha Nation to Arian Tashke or Lina at www.nationalspringclean.org. The Parchle Hemmerch, a Gathenya Ogun, be Mishaguber La Hila, Hundunanal, a Honyal Alling. Highland Radio Weather Updates brought to you by Michael Hennies. Support a local Donegal business with Michael Hennies. From fashion to home essentials, find everything you need for any occasion. Shop Michael Honey's Bally Buffet for quality you can trust. Cloudy and misty today with outbreaks of rain and drizzle persistent for a time in the morning and again later in the afternoon and evening. Some of it will be heavy, becoming breezy. It'll be mild temperatures, 12 to 15 degrees. We're joined on the programme now by Dr Dennis McCauley, who is president of the Irish Medical Organisation. And before I uh, wish you congratulations, I'm sure I picked up from you or you hinted in the past that maybe you had one eye on slowing down a little bit and, and what have you. And yet here you are now, the, uh, the, the president of the Irish Medical Organisation. You so you sold me a pup, Dennis. I think so. No, I think <laughs> that the generally the presidency is given to the old to the old boys as they're going uh, out, Greg. So maybe that's more appropriate. So I, maybe, think maybe a, I think there's a little bit more. To, I think there's a little bit more to it than that. But uh, no, congratulations, uh, non uh, the less. And I'm sure a, a wonderful experience making your first address to uh, in Killarney. It was. I think. The Irish Medical Organisation is a union for all doctors, and we, you know, they, we we try our hardest to get resourcing for for the for the to give the best care for our patients, but also to retain doctors. So we're trying so hard to highlight areas where I think doctors need to be. The, we want to keep uh, the the doctors who train uh, in Ireland um, to here rather than leaving. I think we've heard from people who've been in Australia recently, a number of people, um, and they've just been telling us the junior doctors are, and the doctors generally are saying how much different it is there, the respect they're, they're, they're showing, the, the career progression. So we are trying to highlight that, that the role of the doctor, the expertise of the doctor, and really the only thing that can replace a doctor is a doctor. Yeah, and I think that was framed in that um, I don't think anyone uh, w- w- would say we could... You know what we we obviously we really need to uh, value our patients and the patients' experience and their outcomes and all of that, but we can't neglect the doctors uh, and the staff that actually ensure that as well. And often, I think that's somewhat overlooked. I think so. I think there is a commentary as well, Greg, that if you increase the multidisciplinary team generally, you can in some way overcome the deficit. You know that the the, the doctor deficit that there is. There's a new. There's a new sort of health grade in the UK and it's coming in here. It's called a, a medical physician uh, associate. Now these have med- they have a they have training. Um, but we found that, it, that in Ireland they are sometimes put on the rota when there's a deficit uh, for if there's a doctor, if there isn't a doctor to cover rota, these 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 associates are put on. Now these these uh, these healthcare team members cannot prescribe, they cannot diag- diagnose. So there is a a danger there. So we highlighted that to both the minister and to the head of the HSC about that. And I think they have listened to us because the experience in the UK is that th- this this has led to very serious problems. So I think, yes, I think respect, I think respect for our junior doctors, particularly, I think they're working illegal hours. There are certain doctors going on a ward on a Monday, not knowing what night they're working that week when they have health care issues. They are, you know, they are really feeling very, very stressed. And this is not just and the odd one. Over 90%, if my memory serves me correct, over 90% of junior doctors do frequently work overtime. And, and also, as you've just mentioned, no certainty over their work schedule. Not a very nice working environment in terms of, of, of planning, family life, you know, feeling appreciated. You know, if we try and put ourselves in that position, even in a different line of work, how long would you stick it? Oh, you need to be respected. And I think that latter thing about rotas, that doesn't cost money. You know, it doesn't cost resources. It just is a matter of just showing respect. I think the doctors move, they move, you know, jobs every six months uh, in their training. And everywhere they go, they, they have emergency tax for the first three months. Just simple. And like, I know it is not, like your listeners are probably saying, well, that's fine, you know, but it isn't really. If you want to retain a young 
well-trained workforce, you have to just be sensible. So those are the those are some of the issues. I, I, I think as well, we were highlighting the fact that it is harder for a doctor to practice medicine in Ireland. And there's a, a number of reasons for that. There's simple reasons that we all know of, beds. Thankfully, both the HSE head and, and the Minister for Health, in any plan now, they recognise that beds are number one. Consultants, one in five consultants posts aren't filled. And there's a turnover of, of consultants once again because of the of the, the actual circumstances. But I think even going beyond that, um, I think that, you know, the you know, even from a um um political point of view, there are this is now we're entering election season. I would hate to see medicine being used as a political football for people over promising for things that they can't achieve. Um, and finally, I think medical legally in Ireland, it is it is getting a much more difficult situation. We find I find young doctors are practicing medical legal practice rather than best practice. Perhaps they're worried about being sued in in the hospital. They will avoid treating certain patients in general practice. They will over refer because they're afraid of being sued or have been sued, which is a very stressful circumstance. And then finally. I think we have to, I think as president, I've, I've sort of asked that we stand up aggressively to, mis to misinformation. I well, think can that I come to that in a moment? So I, I do want to talk to you about that because it is important. But, you know, there's. I, I'm just quite interested in, in your comments there and the comments that you made in relation to this becoming a political football in that, you know, I, again, and I've I said this, I keep saying this a number of times, that we, the public now, see through rhetoric and words you know, it's action. And that was demonstrated in the most recent referenda, which we'll not get into, obviously. But that was words and rhetoric that meant nothing. People wanted to see more support for carers or whatever it might be. And here we go again, you know, whereby mm -hmm. you it's quite right what you say. People might overpromise. People might say it's a priority. But if it is a priority, well, let's talk about the recruitment ban. Let's talk about why that was introduced, why it's not being lifted, and the impact that's actually happening, or the impacts that's actually having on waiting lists. That's basic. We don't have to get all complicated about what we can and cannot. Let's just talk about the recruitment ban and its impact. Oh, definitely. I think that the recruitment ban, particularly for junior doctors, again, if somebody gets sick, you know, it's the same with every job. If somebody gets sick, the rota... And if they're in in the HSE, if you're in a group of seven, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a physio, whether you're a a, a care assistant, and if if there's six of you and, and two of you get sick, then that's four of you have to keep doing the work for six. And there's just an expectation that these people will do more nights, do do more work, and stuff like that. And all the area, all the stresses and and the dangers that comes to both the patient and to the person themselves. So yeah, the recruitment ban was something that we highlighted particularly, particularly for junior doctors from our context as a union representing doctors, that if you've if you're if you're under if you're working illegal hours anyway, if you've somebody gets sick in your in your rota, you're gonna work out you're gonna work more illegal hours. So those are the simple things. I think where we talk about the promising is that a good a good idea doesn't always make health policy. I think that the concept of just free GP care for all sounds a really good idea. And and I think theoretically that is a good idea and I'm not against it. But you need to have the capacity in the system to actually do that. It's no good having free access when the ease of access of that, no, to that well, service listen, listen, is completely... It, it, and the bottom gained. line is, is, and this is the problem uh, it, it, to some extent, part of the problem, is the, the, the minister who announced it gets the lift from it because it sounds like they're you know they're making uh, doing something fantastic that will make life easier for some people or cheaper or whatever it might be but then you have the GPs that actually have to deal with the reality of the implementation of that or telling people that there's no spaces or uh, telling people why the phones aren't being answered you know that's uh, that to mm. some extent is a, a minister just as the often used phrase now is chucking the chucking the GPs under the bus because the, the announcement is there. It's a great headline, but it has to be delivered. And I think the biggest thing, I think, when in any health policy, the first thing should be where are that where are the beds? I think that there's no. It's it's very hard that it's, uh, there aren't very many votes. The uni open up a hospital once in a while, so you can't really get the bounce that you talk about. You can talk about policies, but we need five thousand beds. Remember the the emergency issue in in Letterkenny 
is nothing to do with the emergency um, department. It's to do with the fact that there's thing called boarding. If you have, say, seven slots to, 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 to treat patients and four of them are on patients who have been accepted by the team, they've like, accepted the medical team to go on to the ward and you have four people in your seven slots, it means you've only three slots. And as well, the nurses and casually then have to look after those four people and that's not their, that's not their uh, responsibility either. So I think the... The most politically sensible thing to ask for is just beds. Give us beds, and I think the system will survive. Without beds, it won't survive. I think that when you look at the the potential, in, the, 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 the projected increase in medical work that there is over the next 20 years, the bed base at the present minute mm -hmm. is not sufficient for this amount of work. But yeah. in 15 years' time, the amount of medical care that the country will ha will need is much greater. Now, with, that in mind, though, uh, with that in mind, Dennis, the, the one way to th free up beds is throughput and, and a hospital working in a better way. Um, do you think that the unions, the doctors, the consultants or what have you need to sort of also take their sh uh, share of the responsibility of what that might be and how we run our hospitals, the sort of nine to five, Monday to Friday. There's an awful lot of resistance and I'm, I'm sure it's a, a source of frustration for the health minister in, in how we do that. You know, people sitting waiting for an X-ray and the X-ray department is, is shut till nine o'clock the next morning. I'm not saying that's the case, but as an example, right? But they're still sitting there for seven, eight, nine, ten hours waiting on that. That that has to be part of the conversation as well, does it not? In in we can't have junior doctors. We won't let a, a lorry driver drive uh, beyond a certain amount of time because it becomes unsafe. And we could only say the same, I presume, of junior doctors. But that has to be part of the conversation, surely, uh, too, Dennis. Oh, I think so. I, I, and and I think it is. Uh, I would say percentage wise, beds eighty percent, work practices 20 twenty twenty percent. When you look at at Letter Kenny. Um, the, they would say that their bed occupancy rate is 90, 96%. Now, in order to function, it has to be 80, 81, 82%. And I would say the bed occupancy in, in Letterkenny is over 100% because there are there are, there are are trolleys in corridors all of the time. That means the beds are occupied all of the time. So if a bed becomes free, it's really a trolley coming free. So, yes, I, and I think that the new consultant con, a contract talks about consultants coming in, but consultants in Letterkenny particularly are on the are there all weekend anyway, trying so hard to to see who is well enough to discharge, mm -hmm. and then the issue is can, can they discharge them to some someplace? So I think, I think the the panacea seems to be oh blame a body a group, um, that they're not coming in. If you look at the physicians and the surgeons in Letterkenny, I speak to them all of the time as the coroner. They're on the ward all of the time. Okay. There are decision makers making commentary all of the time. But I agree with you. The concept is important. You need to look at work practices to maximise what you have. But at the present minute, it is deck chairs on the Titanic, yeah. really. Until you have the extra beds and the that and the new go on to award in Letterkenny or in Sligo or a, anywhere that for a day there may be a bed that's not used. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that? Mm -hmm. I can remember mm -hmm. those days, yeah. but I can't can't imagine them now. Right. Um, and, and just a word on on med medical misinformation, disinformation. Yeah. No. I think I think I, I think we have to. I, we have to be strident ab about it. I think if you look at COVID during the COVID time, Greg, I would say that the amount of times we were on the radio at that stage, remember, we never we never stopped talking. Mm -hmm. But the Irish population actually reacted to, to good information. It wasn't the stick, it was the carrot. I think we gave good information. People made very healthy decisions and they did it because not because they were afraid, because they understood. And that was a great time. The messaging was fantastic at that time. It was coordinated almost on a daily basis with meetings. Now, when you look at children's immunizations, I, I would say that I think that you have to, I would almost demand that parents all over Donegal sit down with their amongst themselves and their partners and say okay we have to have a discussion are we going to give the vaccine or not and i think that i would i think it's a i would almost it's their it's their moral and duty to their child that they sit and have a discussion now at the discussion my job then is to bring the information to them so that they can make a, a valued and practical decision now i would sort of say the decision of whether to give the mmr which is totally safe against all the 
problems with measles and with infertility associated with mumps, I think it's a no it's a no-brainer when you take it into your consciousness. So my it is the responsibility of every parent in this county to have a discussion. And that discussion, and it's my responsibility then to bring the information to them so that they can have a, a, a they can have all the good and the all the 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 the, nor, the good information there and make that decision. Now whatever decision they make that is their right. But they have to take it from the subconsciousness and just say, no, this is optional. I don't have to do it. They have to do that mm. because children's immunization isn't an option. No, for sure. And, and I get you, but I don't think it can be. Dis- I don't think we can discount either. And, 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 and I'm not criti- uh, contra- contradicting what you says about the COVID situation, but <clears throat> a lot of the conversation about vaccines, what the vaccine might do, then what it might not do, the level of protection it might give, might not give the population being very strongly coerced into taking the vaccine. We, history has shown that that then does have a knock-on effect on, on, on proven long-term uh, very effective vaccines as well. So I don't discount a lot was got right, but I think some of the stuff that got wrong we're trying to undo right now. I think so, but I think I think I agree with that and disagree with that. I agree that at the end of COVID, there were situations where the, the vaccine was almost deemed to be optional, and you were sort of given it. You can take it if you want to, and that sort of that has a, that's a bad optic. I think that when it comes to the COVID emergency, I think there has to be a practical review of what we did well, what what we didn't do well. I think coercion is probably a word I would disagree with. I think at the very beginning, the with the vaccine just just coming out, I think. To, towards the the sort of four or five months in when people were beginning to sort of say, well, well now at the beginning everybody just wanted the vaccine. Later, later in, they were they were making decisions on information rather yeah, than. I, I know that, and we could I, argue but, that before. But I know my nineteen year old son at the time only got a vaccine because he could go out with his friends, and not because he yeah. was not because he, he was anti vaccine. He just wasn't really that involved in all the in all of and, the conversation. And the truth was, is that was the passport into the pub. No, he's just not a big drinker, by the way. That sounds like he was desperate, but you know, there was uh, there was the pub vaccine, and I accept that. But I'm when when we were getting down below thirty, I was sort of you know I was I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been as as ardent about above above thirty. And and remember, the other thing about the COVID vaccine, it was that the vaccine helped to, they, it didn't prevent you getting something. Yeah. It made it just less worse. Yeah, but that Whereas, messaging came a little bit down the line. We're not anyway. Yeah. There will be an inquiry into this, and we're not going to sort it out. I take oh, your point, is, and I, I respect and I, exactly what you're I, saying. But initially, it was to protect you, and then it was to sort of so, to to soften the blow. Uh, but in, in any case, that's history. Uh, oh, my point generally was is the fact that we're able to sort of back and forward on that to some extent, Dennis. And I'll always bow to your medical expertise feeds in a little bit to to vaccine hesitancy now which it shouldn't really in and, relation and, and I to think the proven that, vaccines I, think, I know time is going on but i think before it was beginning to slip anyway and i think that i think the whole it was it was vaccine fatigue maybe people feeling they were told what to do the optionality of the vaccine yeah. towards they, they all have issues but we now have a situation that we need to protect our children mm. i think that it is. Um, I'm, look, I'm even looking like a politician now with the arm out, like, with the finger out like this. But we have to protect our children, and I think that I would ask everybody to actually have a discussion. And if you don't have a discussion, I think it is inappropriate. And that discussion has to have the pro- the best information available. And that's my job. Listen, thank you very much. We'll look forward to speaking to you uh, in the future, as always. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis McCauley. The Nine Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union with monster loans available up to €60,000 for all occasions. Visit letterkennycu.ie. For day-to-day healthcare needs, generations have trusted the experienced staff at McGee's Chemist Letterkenny. From coughs and colds to aches and pains, from vitamin supplements to first aid essentials. McGee's have what you need when you need it with a full prescription service available daily. McGee's Chemist Main Street Letterkenny for healthcare help and advice you can always trust. Sheena Noel Design, formerly the Fabric Centre, Letterkenny is now open in Boncrana with a beautiful new studio ready to welcome you. With a vast fabric and wallpaper library, we deliver beautiful curtains, Roman blinds and upholstery. Motorised Blind Specialist. 
we have the inspiration to finish your home. Contact us on 083 3781 871 or check out our social media and website sheenanoeldesign.com for more. Did you know Tinny's Toys stock top toy brands like the Care Bears, VTech, Leapfrog, Lamaze, Playmobil, Tonka and much more. We also have a massive range of outdoor toys like swings, slides, swing ball, goal posts and rebounders. And don't forget, we're still Ireland's largest farm toy superstore. Open Monday to Saturday, Leck Road, Letterkenny or online at tinnystoys.com. For new perspectives and a fresh vision, join me, Greg Hughes, on the 9 Till Noon Show every Thursday at 10.15 for your voice, your community. With all the stories that matter across the Northwest, it's Greg Hughes on the 9 to Noon Show on Highland Radio. Okay, at a minute past nine, or a minute past nine, a minute past eleven, let's get a news update. It's over to Donald Kavanagh. Thank you, Greg. Good morning. Donegal County Council is being urged to provide service sites with a view toward providing them to young middle income earners under an affordable housing scheme. Councillor Patrick McGowan says young middle income earners who can't get onto the property ladder need support, and while the council is currently carrying out a survey to determine the need for affordable housing initiatives, it should also be planning the location of sites and discussing the potential with utility companies. Disappointment has been expressed in relation to the potential stalling of a tourism development project at Fort Dunry. Councillor Rena Donaghy is on the committee overseeing the development. She says objectors have put a spanner in the works with on board Planola now seeking an environmental impact assessment, even though the initial expert advice was it wasn't required. And there was also a comprehensive public consultation. Councillor Donaghy says the €12.5 million Euro project could be delayed for years or even lost completely. Tijuk Simon Harris will face his first leader's questions this afternoon. He'll respond to statements and queries from opposition parties in the Dáil. Yesterday, the 37-year-old became the country's youngest ever leader. A Donegal councillor is warning that if a life is lost due to the fire service being unable to access a fire hydrant, responsibility will lie with Ishka Erin. It's been confirmed the utility is responsible for the provision and maintenance of hydrants. There have been numerous incidents where, while responding to call-outs, the Donegal Fire Service has been unable to access the nearest hydrant. And MEPs will vote today on new laws to tighten migration in the EU. The new Pact on Migration and Asylum was agreed by Member States in December. Justice Minister Helen McEntee secured Oireachtas' approval for Ireland to opt in last month. It would give EU countries the option of making financial contributions or of providing support to other Member States instead of accepting migrants themselves. There are the headlines. Back with news headlines again at 12 noon. Donald, thank you very much indeed. As we mentioned the following from Aldi, you probably won't be able to concentrate on anything else. So, hope you're not doing dental work. Cottage pie made with board be a quality assured Irish organic lean round steak mince, 5% fat. Was $4.99, now $3.99. One of our super six fresh meat offers this week. Buy all six and save even more. Follow the path to lower prices. Go all Aldi. See in store or online for offers, terms and conditions while stocks last. Okay, you're very welcome to the last hour of the Nine Till Noon Show. It's Wellness Wednesday now. Patrick uh, Holford is author of Upgrade Your Brain. He joins us right now. Patrick, good morning to you. Good morning. Sounds fantastic. Is artificial intelligence involved in this, or do we have to rely on our own intelligence, I wonder? Well, it may be that artificial intelligence will drive down our intelligence. I think you're right, indeed. Um, now, the book is out on the 25th of April, published by Harper Collins. Uh, and you uh, offer uh, advice on how people can unlock your life's full potential. Um, we, we, we can upgrade our brain, but our brain is incredibly underutilised. I mean, we really don't. I think we understand more about the, the cosmos than we do our brain sometimes. I think you're right. It's definitely the um, you know the last frontier, so to speak. Just to give you a little bit of context to this, I, I run a charity called foodforthebrain.org, and we've tested over 400,000 people now on their cognitive function performance, which actually uh, uh, starts to slip 30 years before a diagnosis of dementia, Alzheimer's. And the book is not all about Alzheimer's dementia, but I, I want to point out here, and this is just an undeniable fact, that less than 1% 
of Alzheimer's is caused by genes. So we literally, it is what you eat and how you live um, that determines your brain health. We are the architects of our own brain health. Alzheimer's is not a disease. I mean, it is a disease like diabetes. It's not a natural consequence of the aging process. We all know people who've lived, you know, well into ripe old age with no loss of mental function. So it's one of the subjects in the book, Upgrade Your Brain, because we are seeing an escalation not only in cognitive decline, but also ADHD, also autism, also depression, also anxiety. And I'm going to tell you one fact that is totally extraordinary that will get your attention. Um, chimps have a brain size of 385 grams. Homo sapiens peaked with a brain size of 1,700 grams, this is done on skull size, about 30,000 years ago. And today, we have an average brain size of 1,330 grams. In other words, Homo sapiens' brain has actually shrunk by up to 20% in the last 30,000 years. It's not to do with genetics. Everything is driven by what we put in our mouth and, as you quite rightly say, then how we use the neural network. That's the point. Uh, and and we, we'll fast forward back to the current times again, but just going back to the 80s, Patrick, you were the first person that were, was actually able to demonstrate that uh, the right nutrition or nutrition in, increased brain power um, by the IQ sort of uh, metric. Yeah, I mean, we did a study which was filmed by BBC Horizon and then published in the Lancet Medical Journal. We had this crazy idea in 85 about um, that let's take a group of 90 school kids and put a third onto high-strength vitamins and minerals. B vitamins are really important. We didn't know about omega-3 then. Um, and a third onto placebo and a third onto nothing. And uh, we hired a professor of psychology Professor David Benton at Swansea University, who thought we were nuts. There's absolutely no way that giving kids a pill with vitamins is going to change their IQ. But actually, their IQ went up by 10 points on the vitamins, three points on the placebo. The study has never been criticized. It was absolutely perfect. And the first study in the world that woke people up to the idea that what you put in your mouth actually changes right now, I mean, not like in 10 years, how you think, how you feel, how you deal with stress, you know, things like sleep and so on. So what's happened for me is I've spent the last 10 years working with a group of 14 of the world's leading professors. One is on omega-3 fats, which are really, really important. I mean, literally, uh, studies of people, the more omega-3 fats, the bigger your brain is or the denser the, the gray matter. Uh, another one expert on B vitamins, B12 is really important. Another one on exercise, another one on sugar and so on. And uh, because I've had this intense time with these geniuses, um, they don't see their one piece. They don't see all the pieces fit together. And uh, that's what Upgrade Your Brain is about. So what I'm doing is I'm spending May in Ireland, uh, starting in Belfast, then Sligo, then working down the coast, mm. uh, giving these two-hour seminars uh, to really show people in very, very practical ways how they can upgrade their own brains. Yeah, and, and we'll give people a sample of that uh, as well uh, so they can go and get more information from you. But it's generally accepted uh, anxiety, depression, dementia, autism, ADHD, uh, the rates are increasing. And, and mm -hmm. there's debates on, 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 on in certain areas about diagnosis and what have you, but we'll leave that to one side to some extent. Is that, in your view as a result of uh, poor nutrition? Well, it's two things. And, and uh, actually, if you look at all the risks for everything, and there are 30 for dementia, for example, you can divide them down into things that affect the structure of the brain, like omega-3, the brain is literally 60% fat. The function of the brain, like sugar, is a fuel. So eating too much sugar definitely is a driver for ADHD, for example, even depression. Omega-3, lack of, is a driver for depression. And then utilization. And the utilization is the engagement. And when you're learning something, you know, the crazy thing is that the way we've set up society is you learn, learn, learn through your teens, possibly go to university. Um, then you get a job and your learning probably starts to slow down. You just do the same thing every day. And then you retire. Uh, which, by the way, increases your risk for dementia because you're not using your brain. So I'm 66. Uh, I've just graduated as a paraglider pilot. I've had to learn meteorology, air law, aerodynamics, and dancing, walking in the hills, anything that uses your body in a way that is not 
just a fixed routine is is doing that utilization so it's so what i mean here is for example we know that kids who spent four hours on their ipads um actually have lower uh, mental health in many respects than those who have under an hour so mindless you know watching of whatever it may be TikTok, etc cetera, etc cetera, is is part of the downgrading of the brain so you need the right nutrition for sure um you need to not be eating loads of sugar for sure and also you need to be engaging your mind and your body which engages your mind because of balance and so on in an active way and often we're not looking at all those pieces. And when you put all those pieces together, you start... I mean, to tell you the terrible, sad truth, the youngest age of a non-genetic... Remember, I said only 1% of Alzheimer's is caused by genes. The youngest age of a non-genetic Alzheimer's diagnosis is age 19. Mm. We, we see studies that pop up uh, on a left-hand column of a, of a tabloid newspaper that talks about... Uh, you know, doing Sudoku or regular crosswords. Mm -hmm. uh, small studies from somewhere or other shows mm -hmm. that uh, people who are active in that regard are less likely to get dementia or Alzheimer's. I mean, you're, uh, I'm not rubbishing that, by the way, but there mm. is a logic to that too then, obviously, given what you said about, you know... Uh, it's not quite no. on this, this uh, paragliding like you are, but yeah, to some yeah, extent yeah. it is challenging the brain on a, on a daily basis. Probably not what we need to be doing, but it, it is in the same space. It's No, it's a step in the right direction. And one of the best studies was in, in London. The taxi drivers uh, have to learn whatever yeah. it is, 30,000 streets of London. And uh, uh, a study looked at those who passed the exam, called the knowledge, and those who failed. Very often they fail and have to redo it again. And they, they literally found more gray matter in the brain, you know, more density of brain from those who passed than those who failed. They'd learned more. But you see, you have people like Jeremy Paxman, you know, super bright guys. We keep reading about all these super bright people who, you know, slip into dementia, which is unnecessary. And the reason can be something remarkably simple. And I'll, I'll give you, you know, I'm not saying it's all about this, but this is one thing, which is that as we get older, we, we malabsorb vitamin B12. And if you don't have B12, you know, you are absolutely heading for Alzheimer's. Uh, a study of one of our colleagues at Oxford, placebo-controlled, gave B vitamins high in B12 or placebo and got up to 73% less shrinkage in the brain in one year. So, I mean, the, the new drugs that have been out, actually the last one, denanomab, was 20% more brain shrinkage in one year. So the point is you could have someone like Jeremy Paxman, super bright, using his mind, doing all the utilisation. But if he unknowingly was a malabsorber of vitamin B12, which, by the way, is in meat, fish, eggs and, and milk, but there is a simple blood test, which um, we've actually pioneered, and you can we do this. I mean, when someone engages with foodforthebrain.org, they get to do the free cognitive function test and the questionnaire and find out what's driving their risk and their weakest links. And we also send them um, a home test kit. They prick their finger and we measure things. And that's that and the book, the book and the test sort of go hand in hand. So you can literally step by step get to the point where you're doing everything mm. to upgrade but your brain. I had say, a guy... Yep, go yeah. ahead. No, go ahead, Patrick, if you want to give uh, that very, example. Very quickly, I had a guy um, called Alan, and Alan was diagnosed with mixed dementia, Alzheimer's and vascular. Uh, he, What happened was he was his wife was finding him in different rooms at night. In other words, he could not find the toilet in his own house. And he went on our website, foodforthebrain.org. In effect, I would have given him the book if we had it then, Upgrade Your Brain. He did everything. Um, you know, not not just B vitamins, not just omega three. Also, exercise. He's now in a Morris dancing group. Uh, he went to bed earlier to get more sleep, which is important. He start he cut right back on his sugar, and now he has planted his entire spring garden. He's back on the computer. You know, we can have a very decent, intelligent conversation. Now, that was very, very late in the day, mm. uh, and probably too late. So. My real hope is that people 
engage in upgrading yeah. their brain. And, and some not people, when they're 70, no, but I younger. Get you. But people yeah. will listen to this and go, well, that sounds good. It sounds fine, right? But then they thought, right, there's a website, so that means there might be, uh, you know, that... And I'm only saying, you know, the cynic, yeah. cynical side of yeah, saying, yeah, oh, yeah. this is a business, isn't it, really? And if this was... If it was as simple as this, why do our countries not give us these uh, prick tests? Yeah. And why do our countries not issue uh, or, or, or incentivize vitamin B12 or fish yeah. oils or what have you? And yeah, I think yeah. that sort of cynicism breeds then. Uh, what no, do you say? To, what correct. do you say to that? Well, I mean, first of all, we are a charity, so we're not for profit. Well, you, that, yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. You know, so everything we're doing just goes straight back in, and we're relatively broke. <laughs> we're actually <laughs> supported by people who become friends of the charity and chip in fifty euro, a, a, you know, a year. So that's that. We have a ton of professors, all of whom are working for nothing. Um, so you know, if you kind of dig deep, no one's making money. No, I'm not here, questioning I, that. Uh, by the way, the, sorry. No, no, that's that's fine. Please do. Um, the next thing, you know, and this you know, might be controversial, but I'm just telling you the truth. Uh, someone from a big pharma company, I won't mention their name, came to Professor David Smith, who, by the way, was the second in charge of Oxford Medical School, who did the research on the B vitamins and the homocysteine blood test, and said, this is a multi-billion dollar drug mm -hmm. if we could patent it. You cannot patent something that exists in nature like a B vitamin. Uh, but because we cannot patent it, kill it. Yeah. So there is no commercial incentive. I would love to think that our governments weren't somehow influenced by pharma and all the rest of it, but they are. Uh, it seems to be that way. So the frustrating thing for us and anyone who digs into the science or looks at our website or anything else is the evidence is impeccable. We know right now, we know right now how to prevent Alzheimer's for the vast majority of people. And you're asking exactly the right question. Why are we not being told this? So the purpose of the book, Upgrade Your Brain, and the tour in Ireland and everywhere else is to say to people, take charge of your own health. You are the architect of your brain's future. Yeah, OK. It is uh, fascinating stuff. Is there a one-stop shop that people can get more info on the book and also if they're interested in uh, going to any of the electors in Dublin, Belfast, Sligo, Galway, Ennis, Tralee, Bantry or Cork through the month of May, is there a one-stop shop that people can get all that info? Yes, the charity is called foodforthebrain.org. So remember that, foodforthebrain.org slash upgrade your brain and then you'll see everything that you need to see uh caller wants to know is there an audio version of uh, your book at this point uh yes i just recorded it okay right it says carmel do you know carmel no i'm only joking um <laughs> In terms of just, like, I'm, I'm not asking you to endorse a brand, Patrick, just finally, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's so much there. Like, you can go into your discount store, you can go into a mm -hmm. top-end chemist, right? And and there's these products everywhere. You know, you can pick them up for 50 cent in, as I say, one of your, your mid-lyle stores or whatever, or, or you could pay whatever. How do people know what's the, the, the right vitamin, the best vitamin, the most effective? Because if someone's going to well, buy into okay. this, right? They yeah, don't want well, to feel well, that they might potentially no, waste their time. Absolutely. Well, number one, if you read the book or you do the test or you go on our website, you can click on supplements and it will explain exactly what to look for. I'll give you an example. The um, What we call the RDA, or I call it the Ridiculous Dietary Arbitrary, for vitamin B12 is 2 microgram. I supplement 10 microgram in a multi because my homocysteine, that's the B12 test, is perfect. But I need more. But I need more than 2. 2 is, you know, too little. Now, if we have somebody with this raised blood homocysteine, in other words, a malabsorber of B12, the only supplements that work in all the studies are 500 micrograms, 250 times the basic RDA. So simple example is if you go into your health food store and you say, oh, I'm excited, I want to take B vitamins. If you're taking it in order to protect your brain and dementia-proof your, your diet, you want one that has 500 micrograms. There, there it goes. On omega-3, we'll learn about EPA and DHA. And, uh, you know, it's really about the dose. It's not really about the price. So um, as long as you're getting the right amount. The point about omega-3, and I want to just, I'll tell you a real quick story, which is kind of fun. I live in Wales. Uh, they discovered 10 years ago uh, the oldest Homo sapiens remains, right, 40,000-year-old. And uh, when they, and it's covered in all this jewelry of shells, they thought it was a woman. It was called Pavilan Woman, but it turned out to be a man from the DNA. 
And when they analysed the diet, a quarter of their diet was marine food, seafood, because that's the easiest food. Go back in those days, there's very little population, you're rolling around an island, where do you get the easiest, simplest, most nutritious food? It's oysters, mussels, cockles, fish caught in rock pools, crabs. You know, it's so easy food. Point is, go back 40,000 years ago, one quarter of their diet was marine food. They're, of course, expending more than double the calories we are, walking, catching wood and et cetera. So half of our entire diet would have to be seafood to have the same level of omega-3 that our ancestors have had for yeah. our entire That's evolution. Yeah. So, so just eating one serving of fish a week is not enough. So we've learned that you probably, to be optimal for omega-3, three servings of fish a week, and oily fish is better, um, so mackerel, salmon, sardines, pilchards, you know, anchovies, those sort of things. And I supplement omega-3 a day. And we can measure this in the blood. This is what we do. It's called the omega-3 index. So we can actually measure if you've got the optimal amount for your brain. And what happens with all of these things is that the side effects are amazing. It not only improves your mood, and your concentration, we get less heart disease, less diabetes, mm. less cancer, less this and so on. So if you get nutrition right for your brain, if you do what's in the book, upgrade your brain, you will have done what's right for your body. All right. Uh, Caller wants to know, do you have advice? I think you've kind of touched on this for anyone who has a attention deficit disorder. Did you say reduce sugars anyway in the first Absolutely. There, there are three sort of big drivers of attention deficit disorder. Um, number one is the sugar. Absolutely. So you've got to get the sugar down and eat a low, basically eat more whole foods with more fiber. So don't drink fruit juice, eat fruit. So number one, sugar. Number two, omega-3s. About 40 studies showing omega-3 supplements improve ADHD. By the way, the point is it's you can do a placebo-controlled trial on a supplement. You can't really do a placebo-controlled trial on a fish. You know, you <laughs> just can't do it. And then the third thing is those B vitamins that I, I mentioned to do with the homocysteine. So let me give you an example of this. A pregnant woman who has a raised homocysteine level, which is very common, will have a child with all the symptoms of ADHD uh, more prevalent at the age of eight. So some of this is set in pregnancy and some of it we can change. But if you've got an ADHD child who's eating tons of sugar, has no fish, has no omega-3, and possibly is lacking B vitamins, it's not surprising. Uh, a caller wants to know too, and I won't hold you very much longer, should we be taking vitamin D during the winter months? Definitely. And by the way, uh, 10 years ago, I got busted by the UK government's advertising standards agency because I ran a campaign to say everyone has to supplement vitamin D in the winter, ideally 3,000 units. And uh, they had a rule which said you cannot imply that you can't get all the nutrients you need from a well-balanced diet. Now, I don't know how it is in Ireland, but the UK government now tell everyone to supplement vitamin D in the winter. Only 5% of people do. And by the way, having a, um, having a high vitamin D compared to a low vitamin D reduces risk of Alzheimer's by 19 times. So it's another important brain factor. We were basically all born... Um, to be naked, living outdoors, and a lot further south than Ireland. Mm. Okay. Uh, can dementia, last one I'll, I'll put to you, be a genetic condition? Uh, one, there, there are two genes called AP and presenilin. And um, if you are unfortunate to have that gene, which is less than 1% of cases, it will run in your family and people will get dementia Alzheimer's in their 50s, usually certainly by their 60s. So if you go, oh, oh my God, my parents got dementia, I, I think I've got the gene. Uh, if they didn't get it until they were 70, 80, um, it's not genetic. Mm. So it, it seems to be, be by all, uh, the consensus seems to be it's lifestyle, really high blood pressure, too much sugar, drinking, smoking. Yeah, but I think that there's, there are some big things that are missed, like the B vitamins and yeah, the omega-3, yeah. and partly because they were never measured in the big studies like the UK Biobank, so the data is, you know, is not there. And partly, I think they're, they're a bit of a challenge because everyone's waiting for a cure. And I tell you, because uh, Alzheimer's, as, as an example, is a function of the structure of the brain and its supply of fuel, which includes antioxidants in fruit and veg, which disarm the exhaust fumes of the fuel supply and utilization. There is nowhere in the brain where one drug is going to stop it. So it's a myth, waiting for a cure. That's what people are doing. 
Um, so it is about diet and lifestyle. And unfortunately, some of the quick wins, I mean, National Institute of Health in the US attributed 22% of the risk of Alzheimer's to that B vitamin factor and 22% to omega-3. So just having those two sorted, uh, you know, could easily cut your risk by a third. But unfortunately, it's a 10p a day or, or sent a pill. And it already has better science um, than all these drugs that have had $100 billion spent to get to this stage. And Big Pharma is not going to give up. I guarantee you within five years, there'll be a blood test, a bit like cholesterol for amyloid or whatever it is. And, uh, and, and the doctor will turn around and say, oh, you've got a high level of this, therefore you need this drug. It's not about drugs. It's about your diet and lifestyle. OK, uh, fascinating stuff. Foodforthebrain.org, you can get more information on uh, the book and the tour. Patrick Holford, author of Upgrade Your Brain, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you being so generous with your time. Take care. Thank you, Greg. Bye-bye. The 9 Till Noon Show with Letterkenny Credit Union. Now offering mortgages from €40,000 to €600,000 with no hidden fees or transaction charges. Letterkenny Credit Union, 9102127. Go full Lidl with exclusive Lidl Plus Super Savers. Board B approved diced Irish chicken fillets were 5 49 now 4 39 Tossing some cherry vine tomatoes, now 51% off at 1 39 And wine of the week, Portuguese Albarino, was 9 99 now 7 69 Scan the Lidl Plus app and go full Lidl today. Get the facts for drinkaware, visit drinkaware.e. I'm making a move. Looking for real choice? Leave diesel behind and make the move to Toyota Hybrid Electric at Kelly's Toyota Letterkenny and Mount Charles. World leading hybrid electric technology, lower emissions driving, with the widest choice of hybrid electric models from Ireland's best selling car brand. With flexible payment options available, make the move today at Kelly's Toyota Letterkenny and Mount Charles. Toyota, built for a better world. Are your small appliances due an upgrade? Irwin Expert Electrical, your ultimate destination for all things electrical. From stylish toasters and kettles to innovative coffee machines and air fryers. Or elevate your tech game with our selection of smartwatches, iPads, laptops and phones and TVs from all your top brands. Stay connected with Irwin Expert Electrical, Letterkenny and Bunkrana. Charge into summer with TUI. Secure your holiday today with savings for families and adults flying from Dublin, Cork and Shannon. Holiday sorted. TUI. Live happy. It's all kicked off at Brian McCormick Sports with new football boots in FG or SG. Try the new Adidas Predator in classic black, red, white. Puma King boots in many options from only $49.99 in adult sizes. Match it up with shorts and socks, gloves and gum shields. Click on bmcsports.ie. At Century Cinemas, we have a selection of event cinema coming up this April with live shows of the Royal Valley, Macmillan Celebrated and Swan Lake. Also, the Met Opera La Rondine by Puccini. To make the event even more luxurious, we will be showing it in our premier screens. To book your tickets, visit our website at centurycinemas.ie. The 9 Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union. Offering low-rate car loans with fast approval. Apply online at letterkennycu.ie or in office today. Ensure the safety of your team with SafeTech. We have part-funded courses in first aid, people moving and handling, confined spaces, food hygiene, quad bikes, fire warden, IPAF mupes, electrofusion, welding and machinery cards for Ireland and UK sites. Also delivering online courses like utilities, water hygiene and construction supervisors. SafeTech can deliver group training at your business premises. To find out more, contact safetech.ie today. Here at Tesco Mobile, we've gone and opened a new phone shop in Letterkenny High. A great wee spot now for a few good deals, like saving €320 Euro when you buy the iPhone 13 for €129.99 on our €35 Euro plan high. So why not stop in and say hi, uh, hello, to Tesco Mobile High. This is Supermarket Mobile. Applies to new bill pay customers on our €35 Euro per month plan. 24-month contract offer ends 1st of May 2024. T's and C's apply. See tescomobile.ie. Craving a taste of bliss by the water, the water's edge in Rathmullen. Join us from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. daily and sample our delicious new breakfast menu. We also have a daily lunch special from 12 p.m. Or why not sample our dinner menu from 4 p.m.? The water's edge Rathmullen, where tranquility and good food come together.
Skoda cars are made for exploring Ireland. But let's add more style, more sexiness, more French. Skoda Fabia, Scala and Kamek models are available in the Monte Carlo range. Black exterior details, excusez-moi, sports seats and bumpers, enchanté and carbon decor. So chic. Order your new 2024 Skoda with more je ne sais quoi at skoda.ie. Skoda, let's explore. Your local Skoda dealer is DMG Motors, Clar Road, Donegal Town. Telephone 074 97 21396 or visit dmgmotors.ie. Only two days left until the big home makeover draw in association with Foy & Company. If you're in, you can completely transform your home with our €10,000 home makeover plus €5,000 in cash. All in association with Foy & Company. Go to highlandradio.com to purchase your tickets and we could be calling you. Entries close this Friday at 12 noon. Uh, it's Wednesday, which means we have Chris Ashmore in studio because the Business Matters podcast goes live uh, on our website and he's live with us as well, I think. You yes. are alive, yes. I'm still here, right, okay. still on the planet. Uh, listen, there's a, a, a very interesting, they all are, but a particularly interesting business matters coming up and an interesting guest as well in the work that they do. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's start with a little bit of news. And you've been looking at new car sales, uh, Chris. Yes, uh, the annual figures, and we heard in a, a previous broadcast, uh, you hadn't bought the only Porsche that had been sold in Donegal. Contrary, contrary to contrary to rumours, but anyway, that's for another day. Um, new car sales uh, for Donegal last month, 310 new sales, which was one up on this time last year. So not, listen, that's not overly interesting. Uh, for the first three months, overall up 15% here in the county, uh, for the people who like their stats, 1,438 compared with 1,252. But the interesting thing is uh, new electric car sales uh, down by 15% in March here in the county, dropping uh, from 130 units to 110. And this is reflected across the whole country. There's been a dip in the new uh, electric car sales. Concerns about range, mm. lack of charging infrastructure, and also a reduction in the price of many of the new electric cars has had a knock-on effect because then people are thinking, well, I'm not going to get as much when I trade in. I, so I, think, it's, too, uh, it's I, I think the early adapter market is being uh, the early adopter market is actually being exhausted now at this point, and now you're getting to the people whereby they're on the fence. Yes. and I think a little bit more needs to be done outside of the industry to. Uh, either answer questions or to address concerns. Because, you know, as I say, you're going to buy an electric car last year. You're probably going to hold on to it, aren't you, mm. for a while. So those people are out of the game now at this point. Yes. And a lot of the conversation is about range anxiety, where do you charge the car, that type of stuff, right? And we get, I don't know how many interviews I've done, and I, I really have to fight not to roll my eyes, about 15 million, 20 million, 25 million has been invested in upgrading the the, the, the car charging network. Come on, people. Yeah. It's like these uh, re return recycle machines. People turn up to the few that are there and they don't work. Or there's a, a, a non-electric car sitting there or someone is charging the car and sod it off for the evening. That's the big problem. People need to know that they can very easily charge their car wherever they are. And until that's done, these figures are going to continue yeah. to stall because why would you put yourself through that anxiety, some might say. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I know somebody who bought uh, an electric car and traded it in a month later. Uh, it went up and down to Belfast a couple of times and just too much hassle having to plan the journey in advance. What's interesting, though, is the uh, the Petric electric sales, and these are hybrids, they are definitely on the way up. And people, because that's giving you, you know, a bit of both worlds, isn't it? And, and you don't have that uncertainty. Yeah. You can still go and top up in the garage. Get Anyone the who drives an electric vehicle, if you drive an all electric vehicle, it's a instant power, it's comfort, it's quietness. You've got all the tech. If you love the tech, it can do magic tricks that you never thought a car could ever do. But basically, if you feel that you are anxious about where you're going and the uh, the ability to access proper fast chargers that can get you up to 80% in 15 to 20 minutes, it's going to continue to put people off. And as you say, the hybrid gives that little bit of security. You can carry the petrol station with you. Yeah. Eight, by the way, eight of the top 10 selling models in Donegal for the first three months are non-European. Okay. 
Uh, Skoda, the only brand in the top 10 that was European, the rest, uh, Kia, Hyundai and Toyota's making up the rest of the top 10. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, good cars too, of course. Uh, now, um, this is interesting because I sometimes think some of these service, uh, surveys don't talk to us here in Donegal because I think the majority of us work in hospitality, we work in factories, we work in retail, and uh, there's no such thing as hybrid working. Uh, but anyway, I suppose these are done on a national scale. What did the latest uh, survey on hybrid working tell us? Yes, now there's a survey was c carried out and it's uh, been detailed release today. It shows that nearly 7 in 10 people stated that they avail of hybrid working. Now, there were about 700 people in this sample. And as you say, it's a national sample. And even if you broke it down, Donegal is, I think, 3.4% of the national population. So if they did sample a few people in Donegal, it's a handful of people. I would say it's two, three out of um, ten. And so, I'd say they're actually working for companies outside you Donegal. Know, yeah. Plus or minus three or four percent error margin. Yeah. Look, it, it's, as they say, it's, it's look, it's a refl reflection of things, but how accurate it is. Well, who knows? A lot it of people have actually lost faith in surveys after the yeah. last two referenda, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, now, this is the CPL salary guide, and it also shows that uh, four in ten people uh, said that flexible and remote working would positively enhance their employment by providing a better work-life balance and increased job satisfaction. You know, well, kind of says what's on the tin okay. there. Uh, but more of more interest, perhaps, more than six in ten will consider asking for a salary increase in the next 12 months and 7 in 10 are considering upskilling in the next 12 months. So uh, people wanting to better themselves and mm. hey, well, there's no shortage of courses I and things to do I just wonder if whoever was doing that survey stepped out onto the street from their office in Dublin. <laughs> but anyway, uh, come here closer to home. Uh, the County Council has uh, given the green light to... Uh, quite a significant development at ATU Donegal. Yeah, and people may have heard about this uh, in the past week or so. ATU in Donegal has been granted planning permission for a new uh, sports campus, uh, subject to a long list of some 30 conditions. Uh, now, this has got the green light by the time the funding is secured and everything. It, it'll take a little bit of time, but it's a very positive uh, bit of news. Uh, a 42-acre site on the Carnamugga, Nocnamona area, just off the Business Park Road. They're talking about up to uh, nine pitches. Uh, there'll also be an indoor dome, so that'll be great for indoor uh, activities, uh, particularly in the winter months, uh, an athletic track, a, a walking trail, all sorts of things. And as we know, the ATU in Letter Kenny, you know, it's relatively cramped in where it is at the moment. There just isn't the space down there to develop uh, outdoor sporting facilities. So 42 acre site, that's a, a sizable site. And uh, there'll be, well, the direct spin off when the construction of that comes in the years to come. And certainly that is good news. And also, we've just kept an eye, of course, Greg, on this programme uh, all about new housing developments mm -hmm. and uh, another one in with the council uh, planning permission being sought for 43 houses in the Tully Arvon area in Bunkrana. Right, OK. National Wellbeing Day. Did you mention this? Uh, no, not yet. I just thought I'd throw it in. I know you love these uh, days that are... There's, there's a national day for something nearly every day now, isn't there? But uh, we'll hear plenty of discussion about remote working because that ties in with wellbeing and workplace. Uh, how many people are accessible now around the clock? You know, do you switch off your phone, your emails, all that mm. sort of well, thing? Well, legally, you're supposed to be able yeah, to disengage, exactly, aren't you? Exactly, and also our mental health and wellbeing. So you'll hear a lot more about that. It's Friday, April the 26th, and I suspect you may mention it again. I think so, Chris. Right, now, coming up on this week's Business Matters. Yes, I've been speaking to uh, Jerry Hohey, who's the general manager of GuestDiary.com. Now, this is an Irish hotel bookings company. It's based in Donegal Town. It's, it's a great success story. They've de developed a great business. In essence, they're providing the software for the hospitality industry, and in particular, small hotels and guest houses, and their booking system brings everything together to use. And it's a guest diary, as the name suggests, so they can look at their internet bookings, the prices, the rooms booked, special instructions, all there all brought it in together and uh, the company was founded back in 2008 
It's been growing uh, steadily over the last uh, few years. Uh, sales staff have doubled from uh, 8 to 16 in the last couple of years, and they moved at the end of last year into a new office in the Donegal Town Enterprise Centre. So all going good. Um, obviously, the Irish market's important, so too is the UK market, and they've uh, customers in a number of countries abroad, notably France, and also Vietnam, where they're growing their business. Um, they launched there four years ago, and companies, hotels in Vietnam, using their system, have logged almost 100,000 reservations. So uh, in this clip, uh, Jerry Hawhey tells us a little bit more about their business in Vietnam. We built up a relationship with a, with a gentleman over there that was working in a hotel um, doing sales and marketing, OK? And he was a very amicable chap, and we just got to know him a lot, lot better. And over time, we got us thinking on about Vietnam as a market, you know, and we had our concerns at the outset. Um, but eventually what we did is we employed him as a full-time sales agent in the market in 2019. Now, that came with its own set of challenges, as you can imagine. Going out into the Far East markets is challenging at the best of times. But in terms of ourselves here in Donegal, I mean, it, firstly, we had to translate the whole system into the local language, which was a mammoth task in, in and of itself. The other thing, um, obviously, there's certain things within different markets. For example, Vietnam, there's there's legislative um, differences there in terms of how the Vietnamese government wants things to be done on hotel software, for example. So we had to adhere to all those different protocols and rules and regulations that were there. Rather than sit on our hands, we're not the type of people to sit on our hands here in Guest Diary, we decided let's throw the kitchen sink at it and let's employ another individual in the, in, the, in the Vietnamese market. So we duly done so. We went out and found another sales agent there. So basically, we have one sales agent there in Hanoi and another sales agent in Ho Chi Minh City. But overall, that's been going incredibly well for us. Um, we have 60 big hotels there currently in Vietnam as we speak, and that's continuing to grow every week, um, Chris. So currently, that would, I mean, it's in around approximately 10% of our export um, uh, growth at the minute. It's about 10% in the Vietnamese market. I mean, just in terms of booking numbers, when you talk about guests, Chris, I mean, the, I think we looked at it there earlier in the year. I mean, there's probably somewhere north of 100 million uh, US dollars in terms of value of reservations that have gone through our system in the Vietnamese market um, since, we, since we went live there back in about 2019. So it's a bit of a success story, absolutely, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Half a percent of that would be nice. Uh, and presumably to, you know, uh, providers, they have their own website, they're on Trivago, they're on Hotels.com, they're on Airbnb. Uh, and all that type of stuff, and this brings together, you know, yeah. yeah. And uh, a lot of it uh, we mentioned during the interview, uh, Booking.com being one of the big ones. Uh, so this is uh, they've developed. But the this business. isn't the business end. This isn't the user end. We don't use no, that. No, no, no. This, this is the, this is the, the hotels the themselves, and how they make money. The the company in Donegal Town is they have a monthly charge, and it's based on the size of the hotel Fair and the enough. number of rooms. And uh, and they're also uh, looking to uh, expand into other areas. Yeah, developing a, a number of other products. Um, you now, one of them is self service check ins for hotels. I've actually seen one of these abroad. That um, now they're particularly good in in cities where you could walk in. Maybe you're just looking for a bed for, for the night. You don't need any leisure facilities and everything. A little bit like in an airport, you are going to go in with your phone, check in. I just want to in. see that. The one thing I don't understand is is why the check-in process is so convoluted. You, it, the, I, I would love to do some training in this regard, right? You go up to the counter and firstly, there seems to be some doubt that you have a booking at all. And that seems to be my universal experience. It's like, what's the name? Uh, Greg Hughes. Okay. And some, something goes on for about 40 or 50 seconds. You don't know, is this working? Is something happening? Am I am I booked in here? I start, I've taken out my phone and looked down quietly to check the reservation. And then a load of stuff happens. Then you get the forms, which I don't mind. You have to fill that stuff out. And then you, you're standing around. You don't know what's going on. Then the keys are printed. It just seems to be so, in 2024, mm, mm. so convoluted, so many steps. Yeah, and you've mentioned there about the keys and, and the little cards we put in. This is something else that uh, guestdiary.com are, are looking at. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a change away from these door locks on the hotel rooms that we have now. And again, it's going to come to your phone. You'll come up to the door and you'll use your phone 
and there'll be a system there that the, your yeah. number and your phone will unlock that room. So lots like happening it. there. Okay, so. right. The podcast available for you now, right now to uh, stream on our website or download at highlandradio.com. And it's also broadcast on Sunday for those who like to listen to it on the radio, Chris. That's right. Uh, on Sunday after the six o'clock news. And you can also email me at businessmatters at highlandradio.com. Brilliant stuff as always, Chris. And there's a superb back catalogue of uh, podcasts there for those uh, in business, thinking of getting into business, there's lots of tips and tricks and advice and pitfalls and uh, advantages and all that type of stuff. I think it's an amazing resource in that regard, as well as just being a generally a good listen. All right, back with more after these. The Nine Till Noon Show is brought to you by Letterkenny Credit Union, offering low-rate car loans with fast approval. Apply online at letterkennycu.ie or in office today. Attention brides and grooms. Enjoy massive savings at Evolve Clothing, Letterkenny Retail Park. Up to 25% off. All suiting for your special day. Book today and make your wedding dreams a reality with unbeatable discounts. It's time to transform your smile with the help of Blue Poppy Dental, Letterkenny and Donegal Town. Their expert team offer orthodontics, teeth whitening, implants and composite bonding all in-house. Start your journey by calling 074 97 404 404 or easily book your appointment online at a time that suits you through their user-friendly patient portal available anytime anywhere at bluepoppydental.com blue poppy dental and orthodontics that are kenny and donegal town gift vouchers available are you ready for card community games come and make some noise throw shapes run paint cycle sing take to the stage and make friends it doesn't matter where you're from or what you're into there's a place for you at Cairn Community Games because together we're all in. Play your part at cairncommunitygames.ie Celebrate exceptional businesses in Donegal. Nominate your favourite for the Highland Radio Customer Service Awards in association with McElhenney's Department Store. Our Customer Service Awards celebrate the businesses that go above and beyond to provide excellent customer service. To nominate your favourite business, simply visit highlandradio.com, fill out the nomination form and tell us why you love this business. The winners will receive recognition at our special award ceremony on June the 9th. Plus, they'll have the satisfaction of knowing that they made a positive impact on their customers. Nominate now. Nominations close 23rd of April. Highland Radio Weather Updates brought to you by McElhenney's. Support a local Donegal business with McElhenney's. From fashion to home essentials, find everything you need for any occasion. Shop McElhenney's Ballet Buffet for quality you can trust. OK, after a brief uh, rest bite, we will see uh, further outbreaks of rain and drizzle this afternoon and into the evening. Some will be heavy. It's going to become breezy too, and it'll be mild with highest temperatures of 12 to 15 degrees. Now, you heard uh, Chris reference there uh, during the business news. Uh, a potential uh, significant development uh, at ATU. Henry McGarvey is B VP for Finance and Corporate Services and joins us on the programme now. Good morning to you, Henry. Thanks so much for your time. Good morning, Greg. Right, OK, so planning permission has been granted for a major sports complex in Letterkenny. That will, I read, include an indoor dome. So all that's true. Tell us what's planned. Yeah, it's a it's a fairly extensive um, set of plans, Greg. I, I think we... Uh, as you say, the, the news is positive. Um, I heard yourself and, and Chris talking there. It's a, it's a, a permission to grant, and obviously we'll, um, we won't pop the champagne corks just yet yeah. because we have a four-week statutory period to go through before we receive permission. But it's a it's a, it's, it's a large-scale um, project, as you've said, that, that encompasses um, you know, fields for, for Gaelic football, um, for, for um, soccer, for... Um, grass pitches, artificial pitches, the dome that you mentioned. And then the other piece of, of, of work that we've designed into this is really to make this uh, hub a place for the community and, and a place for, for local people to, to visit. Um, we've, we've included walking, running trails, um, children's play park, uh, a community garden. So it's, you know, it's and as well as cricket creases and, and um, hurling walls, Athletics track, so it, it's a it's a fairly extensive uh, piece of infrastructure which will serve both the needs of the university here in Letterkenny and also you know, serve the 
the local community. It's proposed over a 42-acre site at Karnamugga. And as you say, you know, it's not champagne cork popping time just yet. But presumably this will have to be done in phases, will it, Henry? And, and, and over what period of time and uh, beginning with what? Yeah, it's it, it, it will have to be done in phases, as you, as you say. The uh, the the first phase would be the uh, the infrastructure work, really, which would be getting getting the large machinery in there and and clearing the site and dealing with slopes and dealing with drainage and dealing with all of that. So that, that would be the, the first phase, and then we would we would look to to put in the um, really some of the smaller infrastructure, the the, the astroturf. Um, football pitches and um, develop one Gaelic football pitch and just generally do it in probably over four to five phases um, you know, depending on funding etc. This this project has been the the planning and the development Greg that, that, that we've received has been jointly funded through the large scale sports infrastructure fund and the university so it's, it's been a joint effort it's, it's, been, it's been a project that Donegal County Council led out on um, and when we looked for funding four or five years ago and we brought two national sports bodies came on board the Ladies Gaelic Football Association and Cricket Ireland so they we, we had to get them people to come on board and we also got support from local sports organisations local schools and the industry um, up, up in that area in, in Carnamugga not the moment. so it's it's been a joint effort and again as funding becomes available through both the um, infrastructure fund and through the university's own funding, we will just we will develop probably in three to four phases. Over what period of time do you think? Ten to fifteen yeah, years less. Planning permission is I know is is has been granted for five years. Um, we would, I would say, it will be it will take a a lot of things landing right for us to have this finished within five years. Yeah, it, it will be a probably a. I would say a, a three to seven year project to get the, the entire project complete. Uh, a lot of people will go, "Oh, a dome!" Um, talk to me about the the the, the dome and, and and its scale and what it could be used for potentially. Yeah, the dome is is roughly the scale of a. Um, as you say, it, it's. I think I was reading there. It's not the the scale of the dome that a lot of people talk about in in Connacht, the, um, the Connacht GA dome, which is a. A, f- a full size Gaelic football, so it's it, it really it's a it, it, it's a smaller scale. It, it it's more like the size of a a soccer pitch, and and um, it's it's that type of level. And, and against the the, um, the the heights aren't a, as extensive as the as the dome in Connacht. So it's it's that type of level that, that will allow us to do some activity indoors, um, when when the weather doesn't per- permit us to to go outdoor. But it's 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 not a full size. Um, dome like the like the Centre of Excellence in in, 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 in Connacht. I wonder could it could it feasibly host a, a soccer match? Yeah, it could. It absolutely could. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Interesting stuff. And and at what stage might that uh, you know as you work through the, the 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 development phases, you've talked about where you would start. What's the last sort of part of this project as you would see it? Yeah, as you mentioned yourself and, and Chris mentioned there, we've we've conditions and there are around thirty conditions that we have to. Means, comply yeah. with um, uh, planning and that's a lot of that work reflects the work we've already done with transport and infrastructure ireland around the roads and 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 and, and the work we through their safety before we can proceed so a lot of that work on the roads will be the in, initial phases uh, firstly and then as i say the uh, the work on the the infrastructure in terms of just leveling out and 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 drainage etc then we would the dome and the the uh, astroturf, the smaller astroturf um, cages, as such for for indoor football or not indoor, it's, it's outdoor football. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, that type of that would be the first phase, um, and and as I say that the planning conditions we all we, we only start only sitting down with our, our design team this week to go through the planning conditions and see what they mean for us because the planning ask us ask us to develop some of the infrastructure. Um, up up front in terms of maybe the walking trails and all that. So we have to work through all of that detail, Greg, mm. in terms of our compliance with planning um, 
but that can start now really the, the, the exciting thing is that can start with this next sort of step uh having been overcome and and on, and on it goes finally henry uh will you be looking at wh where do you see the the funds for this coming from drawing down national funds peace funds cross-border funds eu funds do you see is it that type of project where you can because there's so many there's a community element to this as well an education element to it a a, a, a physical and mental well-being element to it so there probably is a lot of avenues that you can go down in terms of sourcing funding as this moves forward is that the plan that is the plan and it's, that's the plan we've we've adopted to date it would be difficult to go to go back to the university and say we, oh, we want to spend and, and this project started off break probably in the region of 12 14 million euro project and with construction costs and all of that over the last few years it's probably doubled in, yeah, in, in for sure in cost. yeah to deliver so we certainly won't we certainly can't expect the university to fund 100 percent of this but we will go back we will go back into the large-scale sports infrastructure grant we, uh, and, and into that fund and, and the indications are there, there, there will be a call from that fund to um for further applications in the first half of 2024 so we will we'll go back in there we'll make application the the university is always willing to match fund you know where we we'll get where we're getting funding externally and funding from other sources so there's some of the sources you mentioned there there's there's north south south funding the, the university is looking at um how we commercialize naming rights and how we commercialize our real estate across the, the entire organization so we we have an organization visiting next week which which is going to look at, at that whole commercialization aspect of the university and we will be including this sports development in their itinerary next week as part of their visit to see you know are there opportunities in there to, yeah, to sure. leverage funding so we will look wherever we can to to, to i suppose combine funding um from from different sources and just try and move the project on in, in, in a phase basis brilliant okay as i say it's early doors but uh every journey starts with uh and continues sorry it's not we're well past the beginning i know you've been working flat on this but just when we start to talk about planning and overcoming a hurling and move a hurdle and moving on to the next one it's all very positive henry thank you so much for being available to us i appreciate it Thank you, Greg. Bye-bye. Henry McGarvey there, VP for Finance and Corporate Services, ATU uh, Donegal. By the way, you just really have uh, the rest of today and tomorrow to enter our €10,000 home makeover ex uh, draw with an extra cash giveaway as well. Um, so you can buy your tickets right now on our website, highlandradio.com. On Friday afternoon, someone's going to win a €10,000 home makeover in association with Foy and Company. Uh, and also um, a lucky ticket will be drawn uh, for €5,000 in cash on top of the 10000 So you can get your tickets in now. You, you don't have to answer your phone, by the way, or, or take a call. The tickets go into the draw drum. We pull a ticket and you've won. Uh, and we'll make contact with you by hook or by crook. Uh, so if you want to win a €10,000 home makeover in association with our friends at Foy & Company, plus €5,000 in cash. The odds are pretty good on this, by the way. Uh, I'm not overselling it, but... You enter a lot of competitions whereby you're talking tens of thousands of entrants. You have a good chance in this one, as good a chance as anyone. Um, so you can buy your tickets right now on our website, highlandradio.com. Uh, safe and secure to do that. If you want to give us a call or ask any questions, 07491 25,000. But the lines will be closing on Friday and someone is going to uh, be 15,000 euro better off by way of 5,000 euro in cash and 10,000 euro for a home makeover. Uh, tickets are a tenner. If you can afford it, it's completely up to you, of course. Uh, they get cheaper after that. Six for 50, 10 for 80. Okay, closing date for the draws around midday on Friday. So uh, the window of opportunity is narrowing all the while. Okay, a caller says, I live on Leck Road. The traffic is horrific. Leck Graveyard is there for ages. I haven't heard this issue raised since the last election. Um, right, we have talked about that. I can't remember how far back it is, so you can may well be right. Uh, what an excellent speaker you had on earlier. I'm going to take his advice. I'm off to get the fish vitamin B12 and omega-3. Hi, Greg. In relation to the tickets for the Donegal versus Derry game, they can be uh, gotten on the website gaa.ie. I'm sure the next round of games, you would hope, actually, will be better attended uh, than the games last weekend. Some 1,000-odd watching inter-county games. It's crazy. But anyway, there you go. All right, uh, that is where we have to leave it on the 9 till noon show today. Thanks to Donna Marie Doherty, who researched and produced the show. Thanks to Shannon Wilkins as well, working on the programme. We're back with you tomorrow at 9. Stay tuned. John Bresson.